Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. Uh, this is an interesting episode. I had a full agenda planned for this week, but some of it has to be put on hold because just hours ago, Dan Slott called me at about 5 a.m. my time and was uh, actually he texted me on Skype, you up? And I wasn't, but when I woke up, I texted back and said, I am now. And he's like, hey, let's do a podcast, Spider-Man exit interview. I'm like, yeah, sure. I didn't realize. 801 comes out uh, as we're speaking today, Wednesday. Uh, Also his first issue of Iron Man. But uh, this is a pretty Spidey-focused conversation. Uh, Dan is doing a signing tonight in New York at Forbidden Planet. But uh, he wanted to uh, express some thoughts about... uh, Leaving Spider-Man after ten and a half years. I can't believe it's been that long. I know it was a long time. Ten and a half years? Good Lord. But uh, it's great. Uh, Lots of insight on story arcs and character. Thoughts uh, as well about his various collaborators over the years, both writers and artists that worked with him. And uh, it's a great conversation. What can I say? And it's a long conversation. Dan is uh, one of those go-to guys, as you know, a frequent guest on Word Balloon. And I'm always happy to open the platform up for him to uh, speak his mind, and he does so in this very lengthy and lively conversation on today's Word Balloon. Word Balloon is brought to you, as always, by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thank you for your support via Patreon. If you want to subscribe to Word Balloon, hey, Word Balloon uh, gives you the best comic book conversations, I think, of any comic book podcaster. There, I said it. I mean, I think there are all other great comic book interview podcasts, but uh, this is examples of how lucky I am to have these kind of relationships with the comics community, the creative community, that uh, they call me and say, hey, I want to talk. And uh, that's what I think makes Word Balloon the uh, you know unique show that it is. And I hope you enjoy it. I hope you appreciate all that I'm able to do with Word Balloon. If you would like to subscribe to the podcast via Patreon, that would be great. Wordballoon.com. You can click on the Patreon ad or go to patreon.com slash wordballoon. But thank you very much, League of Word Balloon listeners. Word Balloon is also brought to you by In Stock Trades at InStockTrades.com. Among the books on sale right now from In Stock Trades, uh, the uh, new trade, Volume 8 of Amazing Spider-Man. It's called Worldwide, and it features uh, Dan Slott, Christos Gage, Stuart Immerman, Mike Hawthorne, uh, David Hine. Not that David Hine, as we learn in the, uh, the podcast right away. But uh, this is another great volume leading up to uh, the end of Dan's run. This is the uh, penultimate arc before uh, Dan's final run. 42% off. It's $9.27. Great deals in in-stock trades, as you know. If your orders are $50 or more, you'll receive free shipping, and they make it easy with great books at great prices. Let's, as I'm tapping right now, take a look at more Dan Slot product available for you at InStockTrades.com. You can go back to the Avengers Initiative trade paperback, Basics to Training. This is uh, Dan and uh, Stefano uh, Caselli, doing the great art it's 42 percent off eight dollars and 69 cents you can get the very first volume of brand new day we talk about the brand new day run and uh dan's various collaborators on that both from a writing standpoint and an art standpoint but uh volume one of spider-man brand new day 42 percent off eleven dollars and 59 cents more avengers initiative you can get volume two killed in action that's slot and christos gage and uh, Stefano uh, Caselli and Salvador La Roca and many other artists. 42% off, $11.59. You can also get, uh, let's see, there's Avengers, I Am an Avenger, a great collection, including uh, Dan uh, doing some of these great uh, stories. Uh, It is 42% off and also $14.49. Great stuff. I'm going to come back and uh, talk to you more about Dan Slot product at the end of the podcast. But uh, see for yourself, you'll find great books at great prices. Not just Dan Slot, lots of other greats as well in InStockTrades.com. All right, without further ado, because, man, what a, what a podcast. This is an epic story. Uh, Dan and I and you literally will hear us from our very first words to our very final words. Uh, it ends and begins in a very kind of casual way. You know, that's kind of how I do things here at Word Balloon. And, uh, again, Dan is one of those go-to guys, and we've been talking about, oh, yeah, we'll do something. Oh, yeah, we'll do something. I mean, Iron Man's starting up Fantastic Four, and, of course, Spider-Man is wrapping up. Well, he had so many thoughts about Spider-Man, despite what he says at the end of the podcast. Uh, maybe maybe the last, you know, 40 minutes or so we, we get off topic. But uh, you got a good two-plus plus hours of serious Spider-Man talk 
on uh, this episode with Dan Slott. Here is the Spider-Man exit interview on today's Word Balloon. I'm glad you called. Hold on a sec. Just want to make sure it's rolling. I'm just up at this. Re- I'm up at this really weird hour because um, we are rolling. <laughs> no, no, because I uh, I fell asleep at something like nine forty five. Okay, okay. Because <laughs> I I'd kind of gone like two days without sleep to try to get the script in. <laughs> then it was like finally in, and I have to be on. Today's the last Spider Man day. Then I'm doing a sign in and uh, you know I'm going into the office for lunch and uh, with my now ex Spider Man editor and uh, just and I'm doing getting a lot of Spidey errands out of the way. Kind <laughs> so of this putting, is this is the Spider Man exit interview then. Yeah, this is the you know so long suckers <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, that's cool. Is you know, uh, is Iron swinging Man into the, swinging into the sunset? Is your you first know? Iron Man coming out today as well? First Iron Man out today. Okay, then I'm is is it okay? Can I flip this for today? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, awesome, Dan. Oh, that's yeah, great. Because, um, yeah, why not? Because uh, I haven't read it yet, and I haven't. Um, is your last is eight oh one coming out today as well? Today is eight oh one. Eight oh one. Today is uh, Amazing Spider Man eight oh one. Uh, Tony Stark Iron Man number one, and for completists, uh, the latest uh, Spider Man Worldwide trade paperback. Oh, lovely, fantastic. Which is yeah, it's the one that um, gets you. Between Venom Inc. all the way up to Go Down Swinging. Cool. So it, it fills in the. It's all those issues that sold out like crazy, and went into like third, fourth, and fifth printings. All the code red, you know, threat level red. Yeah. Issues and the annual. And the annual has a backup story in it uh, about Spider Man Spider Sense. It's really funny. Uh, written by David Hine, who is the co-writer of the Broadway play. Uh, Come from away. I didn't know that's what David was doing. That's fantastic. Oh no, a different David Hine. Oh, there's two David Hines. Oh, so it's not so, British David David Hine. No, it's not the it's not the David Hine who uh, created Spider Man Noir and did many great things. Yeah. Uh, it is this is David Hine, who's a Canadian oh. um, part of a duo. Uh, I I just saw Come from Away on Broadway and. And I, I have a friend who's Canadian, and she was in town, and she really wanted to see it because it's about um, it, it's about Canadians and and what they were doing on nine eleven. And I know that sounds depressing, um, but it's actually a very uplifting uh, musical, and it's all based on true stories. And I was gonna, we were gonna go see it, and Nick Lowe, my Spider Man editor, went, you know, that's the same David Hine who just wrote that story in the annual. Yeah, I and he's like, want me to hook you guys up? And I'm like, yeah. And he gave us a backstage uh, tour after the show. Very cool. So, yeah. It just the it's a small it's a small world, John. Clearly, yes. Yeah. Well, and I and I'll tell you, I have not, I don't know anything about the play, but I was just telling a friend in those post nine eleven days, there used to be a twenty four hour Canadian news channel, NW one. I want to say it was called mm-hmm. something like that. And truly, we were just talking about how, you know, and and certainly in this current era, without getting too political, propaganda oh, is obviously, you know, part of the part of the meal these days. And it was great to see what was going on with nine eleven from a North American point of view. That was not the official U.S. You know, hey, go shopping. That's how to help well, this thing. You know, this this is the story of um, there in Newfoundland. Okay. Newfoundland. Um, yeah. <laughs> there's there's um, a town called Gander. Okay. And and Gander has one of the largest airports in North America that's not used because in the old days the jets didn't have some enough fuel to make really long trips. Right. They'd have to stop. Yeah. They'd have to stop. And this was a hub. Sure. It was a massive hub. Sure. Um, and then once the jets could make the trip without hitting Gander, they just kind of stopped. Wow. No one, no one used this airport anymore. Uh, and they always kept debating the town, whether to tear it down, like they didn't need it. Right. Uh, and it's a town of like 7,000 people. Everybody knows everybody's name. It's this tiny community. And on nine 11, um, they had, I think it was 48 planes 
because American airspace was shut down. Right. They had to put them down somewhere. And suddenly this town had more visitors, had more people on planes than townspeople. Wow. Their town, their population doubled. Sure. And they weren't lifting the restriction on airspace. So suddenly all these people had to be fed. All these people needed places to sleep and shower. They needed clothes. They needed medicine. They needed their animals taken care of. And it's all about this one Canadian town that opened their doors to everyone. That, that, and the community and how this became how, – how all the people like who their planes landed in Gander, they come back every year or so. Oh, wow. To visit, oh, that's to visit cool. all the, yeah. the friends, the people who took them in and sure. the community that grew out of this. Wow. So I bet that helps the economy at Gander and everything as well. well it's not really about that. Well, no, I understand that, but I'm saying but, that's kind of nice, and I don't know how close in the airport, you know, it yeah, impacted uh, them. But yeah, no, no, they, they, yeah, the the airport was there; they just never tore it down. Right, right. And uh, what it's amazing that, like, I between seeing that and within a very short space of time, seeing the Mister Rogers documentary. Oh yeah, yeah. And and how he came back after nine eleven. Uh, to, to have special PSAs and to talk to people as Fred Rogers and tell everyone it was going to be okay and to look for the helpers. And it just made you realize that, you know, in moments of adversity is when we shine. Here, here, here. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's a chance for us to be our best. Um, I, I, especially, you know, these passing weeks, yeah. um, there's, there's a time for all of us. Um, and it's not about taking a high road. It's about trying to find the way for us to be heroes, trying to find the way for us to do what's right, um, to get things done, to have empathy and understanding for everyone. Um, We have to let kindness be who we are again. Um, Anyway. um, That sounds cool. Man, all right. Well, there you go. There you go. Visiting New Yorkers, another play to uh, possibly see. Very cool. Uh, oh, it was it was fantastic. That's it a, was. I, a, I wonder if Franco's going to go see it. He's a big uh, from Art and Franco, the Tiny Titans guys. He uh, he's a big uh, Mister First Nighter Broadway man. When I was, uh, you know, ever since I was like in grade school, all the way through junior high and high school, and even college, I was like a theater kid. Um, always doing the school plays. Always. Uh, when I grew up as a teenager and, uh, we were in England, I used to go to the London West End all the time and see as many plays and as many, uh, musicals and things as I could. And ever since I came to New York, you know, my focus has really been, you know, comics, comics, comics. And I have to be like dragged to the theater, like people coming to visit go, Oh, I want to see a show. Sure. Um, and I'm in New York. I'm in one of the greatest theater <laughs> cities in the world. Yeah. <laughs> and the weird thing is I would only be seeing plays when I'd be visiting friends in England because then I'd be kind of be in vacation mode, you know, and I'd be like, oh, let's go see a play. And ever since I saw Come From Away, and that was because a friend was visiting and wanted to see it, I got such the theater bug now because it was so good. That's it, Yes, yes. It was. So I immediately like bought tickets for some other plays. I'm, I'm going to see the Carrie Mulligan one woman show, uh, Girls and Boys, which is going to be super depressing. But I love Carrie Mulligan. Me too. Uh, oh my god. Yeah, I'm gonna gonna see uh, that pretty soon. I am trying to strong arm a friend. Uh, ever since the Tonys, I had no idea. One of my favorite musicians, someone I see as often as I can in concert, uh, Jonathan Colton. Yeah, I love Jonathan. I've seen him live. Go on. Yeah, I had no idea he wrote, like, one of the numbers, a a recurring number in SpongeBob SquarePants, the musical. I didn't either. That's fantastic. A friend of Greg Pak, we should uh, point out, uh, for our pack, uh, Jonathan. Uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. He does the uh, Code Monkey and all this stuff. And the Saves World, absolutely, yes. The Princess Who Saved Herself and all that. Yeah, it's one of those things where I'm like, I'm jealous. Like Kelly Sue and Matt Fraction are friends with Jonathan Colton. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. That's fantastic. Yeah, they do. I think they do the Joko cruise that he's on. Um, the uh, when he was up at Marvel one time, I had just come back from a convention in Australia and New Zealand, and the flight back for that is 
that's that's an epic trek. You know, you're you're in the air for something, you know, like 28 hours, sure. um, but and and changing planes and doing things, and you're just spent. And they tell you, you know, when you're visiting friends in Australia, New Zealand, or is it like you need a day to decompress? You know, on both ends, sure, you need a day to veg out and drink fluids and get back up on your feet. Sure. And I had just come off the plane from Australia. I was still covered in that kind of film. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, Can't you know, help like, it. You're like, uh, you know, and you feel terrible and your, your tongue's like a, um, like a crazen. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you just, you're, you're a mess. You've seen the same movie eight times. Yes. You, like, yes. I just want to go somewhere and curl into a cocoon, a moist cocoon that will <laughs> reinvigorate me. Sure. And uh, so, hey, Dan, you know, we got Jonathan Colton. He's going to be up at uh, Marvel visiting in like 40 minutes. I'm like, I'm there. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> Jump in the shower and I race up to Marvel. I'm like, hi, Jonathan Colton. I love you. Yeah, man. But, uh, yeah, no. So, yeah, I got to I got to see this now. I'm I'm in this weird spot where it's like and th- this will come full circle. Um like when I uh left Batman Adventures. Mm-hmm. Uh I was so kind of hurt like oh, I loved writing Batman. Like people say I was my most insufferable when I was writing Batman Adventures. <laughs> Like I would just be skipping everywhere, sunshine and rainbows are flying out of my butt. I was just like, I'm writing Batman, you know. I was horrible, and when I was taken off it, and because they were switching from the Batman Adventure style to I can't remember what it was called, but something like Batman Strikes. Yeah, they want- the, yeah, the one that uh, the Edge from U two did the theme song to the show. And, um, yeah, I, that, that second, uh, different kind of animation style. Yeah. Yeah. I had like teen Batman playing a guitar in the bat cave. Yes. To relax. <laughs> uh, they wanted to make sure that the readers knew there was a clean break. Sure. That you guys are the Bruce Tim universe. We're going to bring in a new creative team. And I was like, but I want to keep writing Batman. I'll, I'll write Batman, teen Batman with a guitar. I'll write that. I want to like, no, no, we're, we're switching over. And I was like, I was so mad that I couldn't read Batman for like uh, half a year to a year. I, I just I could not open up a Batman comic. Well, yeah, it's like you broke up with a girlfriend or something. I get it. Uh, I know a famous uh, comic book writer who had two legendary runs of of, of books. I'm not going to rat him out. Uh, there now, I told you it's male. So okay, Gail, yeah. Gail Simone is safe. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, really, and also legendary runs. I think you know women would tell you right away. Yeah, we haven't gotten there yet. We're getting there, oh, but not yet. And the same team, Mindy Newell. Well, that's true. You know, good, yeah, good point, Dan. Uh, Very good point. You're absolutely right about that. Louise Simonson, yes, but you, indeed. No, it's a I this, like they're not my shield. We need a lot more female writers. We oh, need a lot absolutely. more writers of every walk of life. And this is like, uh, oh, a Jewish white guy in comics. I haven't heard of that before. <laughs> what are the odds? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> Mr. Schuster. But yeah, it's like Stanley Stanley Lieber, Jacob Katzberg, <laughs> Katzberg. Oh my God! Yeah, yes. yeah, all these guys. Yeah, we're <laughs> Jews made your comics. It's you true. should appreciate. You should appreciate it. Absolutely. Bri- Brian Michael Bendis. Very true. You know, true. we. I'm sure. We, I think we have the same Haftarah portion in our bar mitzvahs. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> me and Rabbi Bendis. Sure. The the um, where am I going? Uh, so, so yeah, you you could. Oh no no, but like oh, you were talking I, about a creator. Then. I was talking about this famous creator right. whose name I won't mention because I don't want to write him out. Uh, worked on two very legendary runs of yes. two very iconic characters, and I was talking to him at the show, and he was like, he has never never read a comic of either character after he left. Uh, his iconic runs. Yeah. The, you know, we'll never read those characters again. Um, you know, we'll read everything else under the sun, but not those. Like, he left his stamp on each character, did big storylines, and people are like, wow, does that guy like this version of that character? I'm like, never read it. Has no opinion. Sure. This version, never read it. Um, 
So I, I get that. And here's the thing. I am not that way with Spider-Man. I am not that way with She-Hulk. I am not that way. It was really, Batman was the only way I was like that, and it was for like six months. Okay. Um, I even saw there's like a new Silver Surfer annual coming out, and there's Silver Surfer in um, the Infinity Countdown, where it's really back to Surfer, Herald of Galactus, you know, cosmic battles, thousands dying, you know, which is, people go, wow, that's, that's so different from your Surfer. And I'm like, yeah, Mike Allred and my surfer, we had our 29 issues and our 10-page short story, and we put a bow on it, yeah. and it, it exists as a unit, what it is for all time. It's there. It's there in a bubble, and I am totally happy with it. And I can totally go back to reading Surfer shooting through space and blasting bolts and, you know, taking out – you know, planets. I can, I can go to that. I, I have no, no problem at all. Yeah. Um, and a lot of that's because I had such a good, you know, feeling when I walked away uh, from our last surfer. Yeah. Um, and, and same with She-Hulk. Um, you know, when I, I happily passed the baton to Peter David uh, during my first run. We even had a, a, a joint signing together. We arranged it so to show everybody I am literally passing the baton, <laughs> you know, sure. take it away, Peter David. Uh, you kind of you want if you're part of these characters and you're you're part of this legacy of all these other writers and all these creators, all the the giants where you have stood on their shoulders, um, you, you'd like the legacy to prosper and to do well. You, you, you want this institution that you've been a part of to do well. Um, I, I wish Spider-Man well, <laughs> I, I want, you know, I've heard Nick Spencer's plans cause I get the, you know, I'm at the Marvel creative summits and they're, they're great. He has brilliant ideas, um, and, and fun takes and I know where the stories are going and people are saying, Oh my God, he's, he's doing this, but your character is in that. And I'm like, it's not my character. It's, spider-man's character but he's doing that to them and i'm like that's totally cool <laughs> you know it's he's in the chair now this is what you do when you're in the chair and i have had a fantastic experience working on spider-man for ten and a half years i can't believe it's um, been ten and a half years but go it's on. been ten and a half years john <laughs> wow. since brand, yeah. brand new day right was that where you started yeah since since uh spidey five four six uh, the te- there, are, there are some sticklers that go, well, you know, technically you started with the free comic book day issue, which was May of 2007. And, and Brand New Day started with January of 2008. And I'm like, no, no, there's like a massive gap <laughs> where That's true. there's no Spider-Man at all. That was a teaser. That was like a preview. That was a trailer. And January 2008 is when it started. And then there's some people are like, yeah, but your solo run started in November of 2010. And I'm like, being part of that brand new day team, that was work, man. I was constantly doing Spider-Man. Yeah, I, I was I was writing on Spider-Man with three other guys as, quote unquote, the brain trust. Bob and Gale, then, you. Um, yeah. I'm trying to remember who else. Uh, Zeb Wells. Zeb Wells. Mark- Mark Guggenheim. Mark Guggenheim. Yeah. Uh, we were all a team. Yeah. And, Good uh, Look at that. Look where everybody else is right now. And look at where yeah, you I, are. <laughs> I, got, I, got a, I got a lovely email from Bob Gale. I love Bob Gale recently going like, way to go. Um, nice. Very nice. Yeah. And uh, so I got that from uh, – and so all three of those guys kind of burned off because it's a grind. Yeah. It was a grind well, getting a those out. Yeah, it was a Spider Man yeah, Weekly, basically. It was it was almost weekly. Yeah, it was three times a month, and there was one time where we got two issues out one month, and that did not sit well with Stephen J. Wacker. You're right, <laughs> was, absolutely. Who now is Marvel Animation guy? But go on. Yep, Steve was like, you know what? Next month we're getting five out. Jesus, <laughs> <laughs> and we did. Wow. <laughs> And what people didn't realize is, like, the same team 
you know, when we're getting three out of three out a month, three out a month, three out a month, every now and then Steve would go like, and we're doing a special and we're doing an annual. And we're doing this tied into this many. So there are times we were getting out like five, seven, eight issues in a month of, of material. We had a thing called Spider-Man Extra, but we usually helped out with two. And we were doing free comic book day issues and Shadowland and The List and yeah. all this stuff where they needed content. And so we were, we were doing – most of us on um, – the brand new day team, it was like we had, we were putting out, uh, you know, an issue or two a piece of Spidey every month. Sure. Um, and that, that, that can burn you through because you're not just, you're not just telling your own Spider-Man story. You're, you're like part of a relay race. Sure. Passing off the baton and the stuff would happen where you, you just have to get the damn book out. You, you're going, you're going, you're going, you're going, and you're part of the team. So, stuff would happen where I'd be like, okay, guys, guys, I've got an arc I want to do for my next arc. Not the arc I'm doing now, but my next arc. We've talked about this. Spider-Man is going to swap costumes with someone. So can you guys not tell stories where Spider-Man swaps costumes with somebody or there's someone impersonating Spider-Man? And everyone's like, yeah, 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 okay, okay. And then one of the other writers does a story where someone's impersonating Spider-Man. And I go, God, I just told you not to. He's like, oh, sorry, sorry, my bad. Yeah, okay. Well, okay, guys, for the next arc, I want to have some space between his story. So not this arc, but the next one, Spider-Man's going to swap costumes with somebody. Please don't do that beat and no Spider-Man imposters. Like, okay, okay. And then someone else does it. <laughs> and I'm like, dude. You're like, oh, right, right, don't swap costumes. You know, okay, and I'm like, you know, forget it, forget it. I'm not doing that story. Move on, burning it off, going on to the next one. All right, well, quick sidebar. But, Who has uh, swapped costumes and imitated Spider-Man? Because I remember the Bob Gale story, the Daredevil Bob, story that Gale Bob, did. Where... No, no, Bob, 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 yeah, you're mixing them. But you, got, you, you almost got both. Bob did screwball dress as Spider-Man. Okay. But he did it as a beat. And then Mark did Daredevil. Spider Man swaps costumes with Daredevil. So wait, that was the that was the story where Daredevil or uh, um, had to be Matt Murdock in court and needed Daredevil as a witness. And uh, no, I, no, no, that that was a different. Okay, because that's that a Gale a story. I'm, story. I'm reasonably certain that was Gale writing Daredevil in between. That was Gale, that was Gale writing Daredevil. Okay. You're right. You're right. You're right. All right. Yeah, over in Spidey, he I, did Screwball. Takes uh, Spider Man. She's running around in Spider Man's costume, making everyone think Spider Man's doing crimes. And then Mark Guggenheim did a story where Spider Man had his costume destroyed, and he needed a costume, and um, he didn't have one, so he borrowed one of Matt Murdock's. So he's running around doing Spider Man stuff as Daredevil at, in the Daredevil suit. Sure. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very we good. Used, we used to have these long email chains <laughs> where we'd all be like coordinating everything and figuring everything out uh, every day. There was Gmail chats. There was a long email chain of everybody. There were, um, you know, phone calls and this, it would bring us all in, putting us in a room. We were constant in constant contact with all, with everybody to keep this all coordinated. And what would happen is if you didn't have a story immediately coming up, those were the guys on the email chain that would be there, but just cracking jokes. Okay. <laughs> and whoever, whoever would be in the soup would be like, okay, can we all be serious? <laughs> like I need your help. So I have, I have years of these email chains. They're great. <laughs> and when Guggenheim was doing that with Daredevil, uh, Phil Jimenez was the artist and Phil uh, kind of mixed the panels around um, because he thought the shot of Spider-Man swinging in the Daredevil costume merited a splash page. Like, that's a great yeah, visual. Yeah. Don't blow that on panel five. So he, he moved some panels around to scrunch things up in one page so he could have the big splash. Now, Guggenheim works full script, and his line of dialogue that Spider-Man is saying in the Daredevil suit works great as a panel five, but it's just there as a splash. It didn't work. It didn't have the weight. It didn't have the, you know, the pizzazz of here's a splash of Spider-Man swinging in the Daredevil suit. 
So he's on the email chain going, guys, what do I, what do I put here now? And are you there? Yeah, I'm listening. <laughs> I'm intently listening. Yeah, of course I'm Wow. Here. I was like, you know, oh you don't need my always. Wow. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm oh, sure and I'm sure listeners are like, just shut up and let him tell the story, no, John. No, no, no. <laughs> I want that on a keychain on buttons. I want a Suntress. Wow. <laughs> I can push it's, whenever it, I want. It's like the Batman accents of punching during a fight scene and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, sure. Did you, you ever see when they did that on the Avengers with Steve and Peel and they were hitting each other with the actual placards yes. that said the word? Yes. Yeah. Great. Uh, okay. Anyway. So Guggenheim's there going, you know, I, I need something. Yeah. And everyone's giving him, like, helpful suggestions. And I'm taking the piss. And I'm going, like, what if he's singing, like, the Spider-Man song but with Daredevil lyrics? And he's like, yeah, that's not helpful, Dan. And I'm like, and then I kept adding lyrics. <laughs> and I did it once where it was like, devil man, devil man, dares whatever a devil can. And he's like, yeah, you're not helping, Dan. <laughs> And that helped. And, and that just egged me on. So, like, when I keep adding more lyrics. Sure. <laughs> and, and he's like, yeah, Dan, you can stop. Dan, you can stop. But I know the way Steve Wacker's mind works. And after he heard, like, the fifth set of lyrics on the email chain, Wacker went, hey, that's not a bad idea. We should do that. <laughs> it is a good idea. No. And they used it. Oh, that's great. That's, that's fantastic. But, but they didn't use my favorite my favorite verse. Which was uh, law degree? It's in Braille, but he'll get you out of jail. Watch out! <laughs> <laughs> there comes the devil, man. That's excellent. That's yeah. very good. Hilarious. Okay, so but we burned off those three guys because it's a grind, and then we got three new guys, and they became the webheads, and I was the the one guy who wouldn't leave. What? I was like, my hands were so tightly gripped around that wheel. Like, you are not getting me off Spider-Man. So that's, that my... second set, was that Wade? That that was Wade and Joe Kelly and Fred Van Lenthe. Oh, sure. Okay, there you go. Absolutely. Yeah. And they were the, we were all the webheads. And I was certain, I was dead certain that my time was done. Like, we had a, we had a meeting at the first brand new day, and... We had, I had already known because I'd been in Marvel retreats about one more day. Um, but a lot of the guys who were brought on had no clue. It was their first time hearing it, which is this is what you're following. This is going to be the new status quo. Yeah. You know, and we knew it was going to be controversial. We were wiping away 25 years of marriage. Yes. Putting, by, we were putting Peter Parker's secret identity back in the box. Uh, yeah, and everyone, Civil thought, War. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone thought there was a lot of potential still in that. Um, yeah, absolutely. I'm one of those people. I was like, "Hey, there are tons of." In fact, I even forgive the sidebar. I uh, I was telling people one of the most emotional and best Spider-Man moments of Civil War is when the Kingpin tries to kill Aunt May, and yeah. Peter goes to the goes to prison. And beats the shit out of beats the shit out of Spider or Kingpin in front of everyone, and it's like you mess with me, this is what happens to you, and it's one of those great moments, much like in your Superior Spider-Man run, when everyone realizes, oh, Spider-Man holds back, and when Spider-Man doesn't hold back, bad things happen to bad guys, and of course, Superior Spider-Man, when uh, Doc Ock as Spider-Man breaks, uh, was it the tarantula's jaw, right? Oh God, I'm trying. He he did a. Tana, he, he, he ripped off Scorpion's lower Scorpion, jaw. Scorpion, that's who it was. Yes, yeah. and it's holy he, shit. He was holding back. Yeah, he was holding back. Yeah. The, the uh, he does. Ugh, it's just horrible. Yes. The um, <laughs> but where was I going? Yeah. So no um, new group. Well, you one more day we, controversy. We, yeah, yes, we, we had the. We knew you know that the marriage was going away. Yeah. We, we were come that we were coming in after the marriage goes away after twenty five years. The secret identity goes back in the box. Spider Man is poor again. He's got web shooters that run out of fluid. Yes, uh, we were we were going that there was going to be a drastic um, shift, status quo yeah. changes, yeah. and then. We were coming on to this new slate, um, and I, I remember uh, talking with uh, with someone who was in the room, going, "You know, this is gonna this is gonna be tough. You know, um, this, this is gonna be, you know, 
th- there are some people who won't come around. Sure. You know, we might not get a fair shake uh, because you just you're making so many big changes. Yeah. You're you're affecting, you know, and people have long boxes of comics that they they care about. And you're kind of telling them we're doing something new now. Right. Um, they might not be so forgiving. And I, I asked separate like, how long do you think it's going to take readers to accept uh, that we're we're moving on? And that person said, like, five years. <laughs> five years. I think it will take them five years. And I was like, oh, man, I, I've got to, uh, you know, I've got to stay on this book for like five years. So they accept. <laughs> so they accept me. And and that person goes, oh, you're not going to be on after five years. <laughs> we'll, we'll get Brubaker, we'll get Fraction, we'll get somebody. It ain't gonna be you. <laughs> In my head, I always had this like five year clock. Um, it, it, very strange. So, um, but but I think um, when I, I I thought that when Brand New Day was wrapping up, we knew when it was wrapping up. Uh, we, we knew how long we were doing the experiment because, like I said, we we burned off three very talented, durable writers <laughs> when they got thrown into the, the meat grinder um, in Brand New Day. And we were we could see that we were starting to burn off the next group of three, you know, yes. with with the webheads. And there is a feeling of, OK, the the three day a month, the three times a month experiment will have run its course by this time. So we kind of knew we were going to switch to a bi-monthly, a bi-weekly Spidey okay. and and a companion book, which would be like Marvel Team-Up, which eventually became Avenging Spider-Man. Um, and I saw the writing on the wall, and I personally thought Joe Kelly was batting a thousand on everything he was doing on Spider-Man. Cool. I, you know, he did American Sun, he did Craven's... Uh, like uh, first hunt or last hunt, which whichever one no, it's first hunt. First hunt, yeah, junior or something. No, no, oh, no. For first hunt was Guggenheim. Oh, he he had a he had a different title for his Craven story. I'm I'm spacing on it because it's in the it's the morning. I understand. I'm not. Worried. Yeah, man, uh, you're running on empty right now. I understand. Yeah, <laughs> no, but he uh, he did this amazing story uh, which brought back Kane. Um, everything he was doing. With just aces, oh my god, his hammerhead arc, the rhino arc, Joe Kelly's rhino arc. So it's the best rhino story ever. When he when he first meets um, Oksana. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and he's going to give up being the rhino. His rhino story was just the best. So I was looking at Joe Kelly, going, "This is the guy. If I'm Steve Wacker and I'm wrapping up the brand new day experiment, and I'm going to put a new writer." Uh, if uh, I'm either going to put a brand new writer on the on what effectively became big time, or if I'm taking anybody out of the group, it's Joe Kelly. Um, that's where my head was. So I wanted to live, <laughs> and I I did not want to stop writing Spider Man. I love Spider Man, so I went. I'm jumping for the uh, Avenging Spider Man lifeboat. That's my lifeboat. Okay. I'll be on. This- I'll be on the secondary book and I'll be happy as a clam. Sure. So I, I made a pitch to Steve over a lunch. Like, here's, you know, why I would like to move over to avenging Spider-Man. And here's what I'd like. Here, here would be my plans. And Steve looked it over and went, you know what? No, I don't want you on avenging Spider-Man. And I was like, in my mind, I went like, damn it. That's it. The ride's over. I'm done. I had, I had my time. That, you know, goodbye, Spidey. And he went, no, I want you on the lead book. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I did not see that coming. Um, and he made one condition, one caveat. I was writing Mighty Avengers at the time. Okay. Yep. And he said, if you do this, if you become the regular Spidey guy, I know your speed. You cannot do it and keep doing Mighty Avengers. You have to give up Mighty Avengers. If you give up Mighty Avengers, um, Amazing Spider-Man is yours. And I was like, I'm going to have to think about that. And I went walking home, and he went walking back to Marvel. And I got on my cell, and I called my pop. 
And I was like, and I told him what had just happened. I'm like, Dad, what should I do? And he's like, what should you do? You've always wanted to write Spider-Man. Are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> Give up Avengers. What, what do you, you know? And I'm like, oh, my God, what have I done? I called Steve. I hung up on my dad and I called Steve before he even reached Marvel. And I'm like, I'm in. So Beautiful, man. There yeah. you go. Well, too bad you didn't have enough uh, stories to fill another uh, uh, eight years or whatever. So. We did our we did our first meeting <laughs> for when I was taking over the book. We had a lunch. It's always a lunch. Um, and he's like, "So what, what? What are your plans for the first year? Hey, you know, what are your plans for when you launch?" And I pull out this yellow legal pad, and I start walking him through the first uh, six months of what became what would be big time. Okay. And Steve's like, "Okay, okay." And then I start walking him through the next six months. And he's like, okay, this is good. This is good. Then I start walking him through the next six months. And he grabs the yellow legal pad and he just starts flipping through page after page after page. Of it. It, was like, it was like, I'm not, we're not going to do this. <laughs> You're not going to do this in this lunch. You're not going to walk me through like seven years of Spider-Man. <laughs> so, I just, I always want to, you know, Spider-Man, FF, Batman are like, the three things where, like, I have notebooks. I, I'll be walking down the street one day and go, Batman should totally do that. I'm just writing that down. You know, That's the awesome. FF should totally do that. Excellent. Well, I was going to say, so we have an indication of uh, you got a lot of stories to tell coming in the I, fall I got of lot, FF. I, Absolutely. Yeah. When yeah, does I FF gotta, start? Yeah. September, right? Uh, August. Oh, August. Excuse me. August. Wow. I'm, I'm so excited about that. Well, that's good, Jack, because this is obviously going to be a Spider-Man talk. Uh, oh, but, yeah. but we're going to have to talk Iron Man and FF in our uh, next uh, conversation, which should happen sooner than later. But go on. Oh, please. Good. Um, Good. But yeah, that was that was uh, that was it. when we had our first brand new day meeting. We were supposed to walk in with Spider-Man ideas. Um, and I went in and I had the same kind of yellow legal pad moment where I was like pitching idea after idea after idea. And Joe Casado was in the room and he had all this butcher paper up on the wall and he was writing everything down. So, you know, Guggenheim's throwing out ideas, Bob Gale's throwing out ideas, everyone's throwing out ideas, and they keep, you know, writing everything down on the wall. And then we go around the, you know, at one point we go around the circle and everyone's like, okay, let's work out the first year. Um, what story do you want to do? And each person is, is you know, I want to, I want to do this, I want to do that. And as they're saying it, Joe is kind of like checking off on the butcher paper, like, next to each idea and eventually they run out of the other guy you know the other guy's ideas because i was a freaking madman it wasn't that they didn't give ideas out they did they gave out a lot of ideas it's just that i wouldn't shut up and i would just you know here's everything i want to do on spider-man <laughs> and just like an explosion of stuff and at one point you know, writers started like poaching my stuff. <laughs> he started going, well, that story sounds interesting. I'll do that one. Oh boy. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. that's one of mine. <laughs> Jesus. And people, people were looking like, Dan, this is for the room. You know, we're trying to do this for the room. I'm like, but, but, and then someone else went after one of mine. Yeah, that's one of my, no, no, no. And like, Dan, we're a team. <laughs> and then at one point I'd do it like a third time. Like that's, I want to do that story. And, Joe Casada goes, Dan, you can't do all of them. <laughs> well, eventually. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that was like my first thought when I became the solo guy was, yes, I can do all of them. <laughs> so, But everyone was cool. You know, for the most part, people, you know, there, there was stuff like um, I threw out for like a big arc of stuff. And uh, where it wasn't like a, a necessarily like a done in one story, like uh, the spider tracer killer was one of mine Okay, mm -hmm. where people were showing up dead as a subplot villains, sometimes even not villains with a spider tracer on them. So it's odd. So it's either a serial killer who's doing this or people think Spider-Man might be a murderer right. or maybe like cops are taking stuff from the evidence locker where they have spider tracers and they're putting them on bodies. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Like what, what's going like dirty cops, yeah. not good. Dirty cop. But it's like, what what's going on? And Guggenheim said, well, I'd like to do the Tracer Killer subplot. And that's cool. Because at the same time, 
like when I'd be working on a Spider-Man story, and this is the way it was in the brand new day era, I'd be stuck on something and I'd throw stuff out to the room and people would go, well, what if you did this beat? Sure. Or what if you did this thing? And I went, oh, that's good. Can I use that? And they'd be like, Dan, we're a team. And I'm like, yeah, use it. So the, uh, there's stuff in my early Brand New Day stuff that, you know, where I go, that's a Bob Gale bit in my story. That's a Zeb Wells bit in my story. That's a Guggenheim bit in my story that they gave me to help out. So it really, it took me a, it took me a while to be the, no, that's mine, to the, <laughs> we're, we're a team. You know, that's, that was something fun, um, was, was getting to that point where it really was like, we're all a team and we're all, we're all making this work. Um, there, I think there was only like one big time where I was a stick in the mud about something where I'd set up a puzzle piece that I wanted to pay off later in one of my later arcs. And it's tricky because if you set up a puzzle piece, fans start talking about it or, the other re- the other writers would start thinking about it, going, you know, I could use that in my story. And you're like, no, 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 no. I built that puzzle piece for me. <laughs> you know, right. that's 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 my long game story. It's really hard in a team setting to build long game. You know, yeah. so like I didn't tell anybody about the mind swap when after I figured out that's where I was going after 600. Okay, um, I was just you know, but I. I didn't pay off on that until I was a solo writer, but I didn't tell people about that piece. Um, there, there's all kinds of different, you know, oh man, I'm going to miss being on this book. Clearly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but at the, at the same time, there is a, you know, this moment where you just kind of, <sighs> I bet the, the hardest, the hardest thing about working on Spider-Man is the frequency of it means that you have to write everything out of sequence so you can feed multiple artists. Sure. So all the trains can come out on time. Absolutely. So uh, you look at my run and everyone remembers the thing they re- the things they remember most are the big arcs of like, you know, and for us it's like can be a big arc is like four issues. So people remember our four issue, five issue, six issue stories the most. Okay they don't realize is those those only happen like once a year because we have to build up to it and we have to clear the runway and we have to whoever's drawing that story needs all the time in the world so you a lot of what you would get in my run are done in ones two parters and three parters yep. constantly coming out like this yep. a lot of times seeding things that would be the big boom six part story sure. um and that's why everyone – like we live in a day and age, especially when I was, uh, you know, deep in the the Bendisy verse, the, the – you know, like when New Avengers and Mighty Avengers were king. Mm-hmm. And, and they – for eight years, Brian was the spearhead of Marvel. Yeah. You know, yeah. Every, every event was coming out of Brian's head. Yeah. Every, every big thing and those were glory years of Marvel. Sure. Um, and people were used to in that era that everyone kind of told five issue, six issue arcs that became the trade. Right. That that was the norm yep. um, for every book but Spider Man because we couldn't do it. We just couldn't do it. So everyone, the weird thing is, whenever we do what everyone normally did, it was considered an event. You know, like they would do a six issue story all the time, right? And when we did a six issue story, suddenly it's Spider Island. It's ends of the earth. Yep. It's, you know, it's the biggest thing ever. And you're like, no, dude, that's a six issue story. Yeah, but in the <laughs> a lot of those two would then also like Spider Island. And I'm glad we're talking about Spider Island for a second. Um, all the miniseries that sprung from Spider Island and uh, mentioning Nick Spencer, who's obviously getting the baton handed to him. Uh, Spider mm-hmm. Island. Didn't he do Cloak and Dagger? Spider Island. He, he did Cloak and Dagger. Oh, he did. He did uh, Superior Foes. He, well, of he course, did, Superior Foes. Sure. Yeah, he did lots of. Great but I was stuff. just saying, in the, terms uh, of the timing of now, where Cloak and Dagger is enjoying its uh, television run, and it's excellent. Oh God! And and yeah, I think back of all those years that talking to all of you men and women 
that, oh, God, I have a Cloak and Dagger pitch to Marvel. Everybody had a Cloak and Dagger pitch to Marvel forever. And I thought one of the best ones was Nick's that he got to do for Spider Island. And it's like, oh, man, how come we're not getting a Cloak and Dagger thing? That was fantastic. That was a great story. And even again in Nick's uh, uh, Captain America Hail Hydra run, uh, that was one of the interesting points of what was happening in New York, that Dagger was kind of helping power New York when it was completely in darkness and stuff. So, again, a little, uh, little sidebar. <laughs> uh, no, no, but, like, um, one of the one of the great things he did was he swapped the colors. He, like, made Dagger, in his Spider Island story, he ended up with Dark Dagger and Light Cloak. Yep, yep. And one of the things I had to do sitting in the chair is leader. when anyone tried to use Cloak and Dagger somewhere else, I'm like, no, you have to stick with what Nick Spencer did. Oh, You can't just have them... You can't have them show up. So many people just are like, well, I didn't read that. Well, tough. Right. This is <laughs> this is where the characters are now. You have to play fair, you know, and play. And they, and a lot of writers will be like, well, now I don't want to use it. <laughs> if, I, if I can't tell my status quo, Cloak and Down, that's why um, during Worldwide, um, I did a whole arc which goes, okay, in case you forgot, they've been swapped. Then I, here I'm gonna I'm gonna put them back to normal. <laughs> <laughs> so, so now you can you know that was one of my one of the things I was trying to clean house so that people could start using cloak and dagger again. Sure, because um, I thought it was a great setup. I think you could have done like you know a year on that easy. Great with them swapped. I thought that was a great idea. Um, it, that's the whole thing that people want to do their own thing, um, and yet. You're, I think a lot of fans, especially guys who do fan fiction, it's fun to do fan fiction. And um, I don't, I don't read any, but I get the the uh, the uh, I, legally I can't, of course, um, because it, it, heaven forbid I write something and it ends up, you know, someone had a fanfic story that was similar. I have to, ha- I have to have a, a barrier. Of safety, understood. So yeah, it's, understood. it's just yeah. the thing. But I understand the appeal of it and the fun of it. That you're off in your, like any novelist or story, you're off in your own corner, doing your own thing and having fun, and then sharing it with people. That there's a people who want to write for the big two, like I was saying before, where I was being terrible and going mine, mine, mine. No, you have to be able to roll with it. You have to be able to go well now. Nick Fury is missing, you know, and all the LMDs are dead. You can't use old man Nick Fury in your stories for a year. Or Hawkeye got blown up in a spaceship. And you're like, but but I want to tell a Hawkeye story. No, you got to play fair. Sure. You sure. got, you know, this is the or, or you know, Mjolnir is destroyed. Right. You know, you. But I want to have Thor hold Mjolnir. I want to write Mjolnir. Tough. <laughs> you know, you gotta play. You know, Spider Man now has Doc Ock's brain in his head. I don't want to write that Spider Man. Tough. This is the Marvel universe. You know, if suddenly Rhodey is Iron Man, you know, and you're writing Secret Wars, you gotta have Rhodey. Yep. <laughs> you know, that's the rule. Spider-Man has a black costume now. You have to use that. Um, I am Spider. I am Spider. Yeah, that's the whole... If you can't roll with those punches, you can't write for the big two. Sure. If you're just going to be... Yeah, if you're somebody who's just going to want to do your thing and not play in that sandbox, then, you know... And then there's other things. Like, I'm writing my story, and I want my character to smoke. You're not getting that done in Marvel, then. It was nice talking to you. You know, there are, you have to be able to go with the flow and do the things. It's very much, uh, you don't get to be Fred Astaire. You're Ginger Rogers. You got to do it backwards and heels. That's right. Well, and further, though, as I'm sure you have come to understand in your many years of writing comics, it's those very rules that inspire great ideas to stay within the boundaries and still come up with something. And you get happy accidents and inspiration mm-hmm. from the restrictions rather than, okay, kid, the candy store is open. Eat all you want. Yeah, it's like that Justice League story where Electric Blue Superman moves the moon by using his electric powers. 
is effing brilliant because he's doing something so Superman level. But with that status quo, it, you know, if, if you were someone who didn't like Electric Blue Superman and you read that story, you go, he is Superman. I'm going to have to read that story because I avoided Electric Blue Superman because yeah. I didn't no. like it. I'm like, yeah, well, that's not Superman. No, but, Goodbye. Yeah, he's got electric powers. What? But no, he has a moment where something's in trouble. And the only way to solve it is to move the moon. And he uses his electric blue Superman powers. And he's like, I'm Superman. I will move the moon. I like it. And the minute he does that, you go, he's Superman. Okay. You can make him electric blue. You can turn him into a, give him an ant head. You can do whatever <laughs> you want to him. He will always be Superman. You know, and the minute the writer hits that, that's the minute you go, oh, wow. Okay. If, but if you're so rigid that your Superman has to be the Superman with red trunks or he's not Superman – you're going to miss out on a lot of great stories. Sure. You know, I hear you. Um, that's that said, boy, do I love that the trunks are back. Yeah. Well, and now, <laughs> I, you know, I don't know how true it is. I hope the same is for Batman because yeah, that whole trunk thing was just ridiculous in general, I, I, in general, John, John, my favorite thing is when you see people doing commissions at cons or getting a chance to do like a guest, uh, you know, do a special variant cover or something. So many of the guys in that era, draw Batman in a crouch in such a way where that part of his crotch is completely in shadow. <laughs> you see it over and over again, because in their mind, they're like, I can't do it. Right. I can't. Now I can imagine. Well, <laughs> forget crouch. about, I understand that for a reader, it sounds silly and that, you know, and again, they, they didn't go to the circus. They never saw acrobats, but from an artistic standpoint, it's a color contrast that, makes the picture better and i can't it, and it, I, I i understand the, the it, it's, it's it's not just that it's it's 50 75 80 years right. of of the norm and when you see it without without it it feels like someone stole batman's trunks right so, like, you almost expect to see Riddler or Joker running ahead of him going, hee-hee-hee, <laughs> you know? Because it, 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 you grew up with it. It's part of your brain. It, it would be like suddenly seeing, um, you know, uh, it, would be, it would be like seeing a, a, an orange stop sign. Right. You know? Right. Well, yeah, the you know, a yellow be, stop well, sign. You'd be like. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you'd just be like. I've seen red stop signs my whole life. My brain hurts. Well, yeah, it was just, and it was a little more subtle because obviously the other colors of Batman still existed, and you're just like something's missing. And with the, as opposed to Superman, where there was such a radical change to the costume, and it's funny you mention other artists doing either you know alternate variant covers or or commissions. Doug Monkey at uh, New York Comic Con, I had him draw me a Superman. And immediately he drew the trunks. I'm like, I'm so glad you do that. He's like, I know who I'm drawing fun. I know for. He's like, I know what you like, John. I, of course you like this. And I'm like, it is. It's it's this beautifully classic Superman that it's it's another one of my frame pieces on the wall, along with a Norm Brayfogle Superman. Because I'm like, Ooh, yeah, I'm like, I'm really glad I got that. And 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 certainly I want Norm's abilities to come back. And I don't even know if he's even thinking along those terms currently. But I was hoping, much like Frazetta. That maybe post stroke he could kind of find his his ability mm -hmm. again. But yeah, I'm like, man, Norm, I, I don't remember ever seeing you draw Superman. And I've got this great shot. I'm looking at it right now of him reacting to a chunk of kryptonite and kind of cowering, or at least yeah. like you know, yeah, yeah, yikes, you know, that kind of thing. And it's beautiful. I, I, there, there was a the thing whenever someone would like Spider Man would change costume, <laughs> like to go to black or to go to Iron Spider, they'd have a problem because they'd have inventory issues that were already drawn. Sure. Or, or the change happens, but oh my God, there's issues already in the works. Where in both cases, both costumes gain the magic ability to click a button and look like the old yeah, suit. Yeah, I, I kind of liked it. I thought that was an elegant solution to the Iron Spider. Yeah, or to morph into the old yeah, suit. Yeah, I didn't know that. I didn't know the symbiote could. Uh... The symbiote, yeah, there's some issues where the symbiote, since it could become any kind of clothing, it could just you know, it could make itself look like the red and blue. Funny. <laughs> That's funny. So you can save that art. Interesting. Or, yeah. Um, 
And uh, yeah, but I wrote an issue of the thing where Spider-Man showed up and I, I didn't get to write Spider-Man often then. So for me to have Spider-Man in your book, I was the exact opposite of the guy I was just trying to talk about. You know, I'm like, I was like, I want red and blue Spider-Man. <laughs> I want. And I was so happy that the suit had the ability to swap. So for like one page, he's sitting next to the thing and the thing looks at him and the thing's effectively being me going, I, I can't stand that, that, that costume, you know? <laughs> and, and this was, this was like the rich thing, you know, the JMS yes. had yes. where he's a billionaire. So he's like, I will give you 40 bucks. <laughs> you know, change it back. And he's like, he clicks and he's like, turns it into the red and blue so they can have a heart to heart talk about something. But Spider-Man's like, you're such an old fart. <laughs> Now, you know, but he, he takes the money because he's Spider-Man. Now, my favorite uh, short uh, but poignant uh, story that you did in your Spider-Man run was, uh, and I'm, I don't even remember if it was during Brand New Day, you'll tell me, but um, when Spider-Man was working with the Fantastic Four again, and they don't remember him initially. And I forget what uh, uh, dimension he goes with. Uh, the, the, the Macroverse. Yes, and it's uh, uh, time moves slowly in the mac- yeah. Macroverse. And just that poignant moment, much like when Barry Allen pulls Wally West out of the Speed Force, and it's like, how can I forget you? And that great shot of, like, all of them just hugging him, and, oh, Peter, how can we forget you? And it was like, oh, there they are. There's the five. They love him. They're like family. <laughs> uh, I, I had so much fun working on doing, doing Spidey in the Alpha. You can tell which characters I care the most about because – there's a fear early on in your career that every story might be your last. Sure. Like it's imposter syndrome where, you know, yes. uh, they're going to, they're going to realize I'm faking it and then I'll never get to work again. <laughs> um, so like you can see it in she Hulk. I just have a guest star at every damn issue. Because it's like a tour of the Marvel Universe. Like, I am getting this all out of my system in case you fire me tomorrow. Yeah. So here's Spider-Man, here's the FF, here's, you know, one after the other after the other. Um, And you can see in all my early work, the characters who keep showing up for guest stars are Spidey and the FF over and over and over again. And when I finally get to pitch stuff, you know, I think one of the – Marvel has a system now where you don't do like – there aren't pitches. Uh, You know, things come up in editorial and then editorial finds the creative team for it. So it, there's no world where you go up and go, I got this great idea for it. No, no, no. Here, we're editorial. Here is we want to we want to do a, uh, you know, I don't know, Jack of Hearts. You know, <laughs> Jack of Hearts is pop- suddenly every every comic with Jack of Hearts, the digital sales are through the roof. We can't explain it, but we have to get a Jack. We need a Jack of Hearts series and it has to go out next week. You know, would you like to write Jack of Hearts? And you're like, we will do. Chief. Sounds great. So, where do I start? Where do I start? Are there any? I'm sure there are. Of course there are. I'm sure we can no. Google search a way to find the Jack of Hearts fans. Absolutely. Oh, oh. I was like, well, what do you want to do? I'm like, Moon Knight. No, but the... Uh, Who do you want to do? Moon Knight. Moon Knight, Moon Knight would be my thing I would like uh, in a heartbeat. Um, still. You know, still. I love Moon Knight. I would love to see you uh, write the Moon Knight. Absolutely, man. He, he's, he's my Jack of Hearts. Um, I think he's a little higher in the spectrum than... Uh, than uh, <laughs> The Jack Absolutely. of Hearts. No, he, he's, he's the only – Moon Knight's the only Marvel character where I own every single appearance. Oh, that's hilarious. That's fantastic. Even even Werewolf by Night stuff. Well, come on, man. That's where he came from, of course. Oh, dude. I, I was up at uh, Valiant, what was called Acclaim, mm-hmm. and they introduced me to Don Perlin, who is their art director. Oh, yes. And the first, yeah. thing, the first thing I said was, Don Perlin, you're the co-creator of Moon Knight. And he stopped and he looked – his kind of head looked up like, hmm, you know, I guess I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, oh, I got to talk to Doug Munch eventually because uh, I, uh, man, oh, him and, oh, oh, Sin Kev- him his, and Sin Kevich. I mean, I've talked to Bill him, about it, but yeah, I got to talk to him. Him and Kevich, that was, that was like my high school jam. I respect that, dude. Like, that was my college jam. <laughs> that's, that's, that's like, I couldn't wait for every issue of their Moon Knight. That was the one where it was like, I started with issue one. I had no idea who the character was. And then I had to go through every back issue bin. I had to find every single appearance. I had to find those rampaging home black and white magazines. Yes. And I had to find whatever I could. I had to know everything about Moon Knight. I thought he was so awesome. 
Um, when I was a Marvel intern, I'd only been up there for like a week. And this is, you know, Dan Slott, the Marvel intern, was the guy who wore his Sunday shoes and literally ironed a pleat into his chinos every day before he went to work with a button down shirt. And like, I was going to be the best intern ever. I'm at Marvel comics. And there'd be guys in the bullpen with, you know, holes in their shirt with porn on the desk. <laughs> you know, but I was like, I'm at Marvel. Um, and w- when I was in that zone, um, Bill Sienkiewicz was up at the office. He was just poking his head in the office and saying hi to everybody. And he popped into the office I was at. And my assistant editor was there. And they said hi to him. And they talked for a while. And I just sat there like, uh, you know, like Mick Jagger had walked in or something. And, and the second he was out and our windows had blinds that were shut, the second the door closed, I got up and I literally started cabbage patching. And I was, I met Bill Sienkiewicz. I met Bill Sienkiewicz. <laughs> and this, out of nowhere, this hand up the back of my head. And I'm like, what? And it's the assistant editor. And they went, don't ever do that fanboy shit again. Yeah. Yeah, man. <laughs> I understand. Sports radio, same thing. It's like, hey, man, you're a pro, not a fan. Sit your don't, ass don't down. Do Absolutely. Not do that. Um, <laughs> it was a valuable lesson. Did someone strike me? Yes, they did. That's hilarious. The back of, That's awesome. The back of their hand. Like, <laughs> damn, this is smack. Um, Goddamn fuck. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, uh, surprised. How, ma- how many times have you had Moon Knight in once, it? Only once. 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 Uh, it's the thing where I always mean to. I always mean to do it, and I never get around to it. Um, I it, it, we'll get there. We'll get I was there. Say, so, but, so expect Tony or, or the FF to uh, welcome Moon Knight for a second. I'm assuming. We'll, we'll see. It'll happen. Um, but you get with um, you get with my stuff, like all the early issues, Spidey and the FF. Spidey and the FF, they just show up all the time, whether it's the Initiative or the Thing or She-Hulk, um, anything I was doing. When I finally got a chance to, like like I was saying, you don't pitch at Marvel. I, I pitched, and the pitch I wanted to do it was Spider-Man Human Torch. And that's how that mini happened. Yeah, you and it Rigo, was, man. Yeah. Uh, oh no, that was no, that was me. And you're you're thinking. Um, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking the Chris Gage follow up. Oh, Spider-Man shame Spider-Man. on me. Okay, Art. yes, all right. No, no, Who was your artist? Uh, uh, Ty Templeton. Yay, Ty Templeton. Hey. Good Lord Master. So, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's. I got people are like, oh, we love that. You like? I think it's like Brevoort. You know, says you come to every project with like a bucket of ideas. You know, and eventually you will you will empty the bucket. And I was like, I will never empty my bucket. But he was like, but when you come to a project for the first time, you're taking all your best shots, like everything you have saved up that you've always wanted to do. And that Spidey Torch five issue mini, it, there is so much love in all five issues yeah. of of just getting out. Like it, it, it was in my mind if I only got to write Spider Man once, you know. And there, there was stuff in there that were like, I will treasure forever. My, my favorite things are the, cause we were mixing and matching, you know, and having Torch go after Spidey villains, having Spidey go after FF and Torch guys. And I found this part in continuity and where it fell naturally, where one day he's paced pot P and the ne- and the next time you see him and it's never explained, he's the trapster. Yeah. The trapster. Yeah. So I have this bit where someone is gunning for the human torch and Spider-Man sees it on a rooftop, like someone aiming a gun and Spider-Man swings in and knocks the guy back. Then he knocks him into the light and it's pace pop pee. <laughs> He's like, you ruined my aim. I was about to destroy the human torch once and for all. And then everyone would know, you know, and who are you? I am pace pop pee. And then it's just these beautiful Ty Templeton panels, nine panel grids of, of like, no one is saying anything. And then, Spider-Man goes, like, does a snort, like, a <clears throat> and then he starts laughing, and he has a laugh fit, like the kind you can't stop, and you start crying, and he's like, peace, puppy, sure. peace, puppy, and he's, like, rolling on the ground, punching the floor, like, peace, puppy, okay, and then he's, like, getting up and trying to compose himself, and peace, puppy, like, this isn't funny, this is, and Spider-Man's like, wait, 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 okay, he's trying, he's trying his level best to compose himself, okay, okay, I'm no, I'm not. I'm not good. 
<laughs> and then finally, Face Pop, he just can't. It, Spider-Man hasn't lifted a finger against him. He just kind of sulks off. And he's like, I'm changing my name. <laughs> I love that whole sequence. But so it's like we did that. We had Spider-Man actually saving the day with Twinkies. Fantastic. Um, Outstanding. And and it was when he was doing the Spider-Mobile and working for these guys (laughs) that that were clearly meant to be Stan and Roy in the old comics. You know, were the guys who hired him to build the the Spider-Mobile. And they worked at an ad firm. And then our story involved, and we brought them on camera, and our story involved uh, the Spider-Mobile. And he uses the Hostess Fruit Pies to, or Golden Sponge Cakes to uh, stop the Super Apes from stealing the Spider-Mobile. <laughs> That's fantastic. And Were they eating them at, at the end of the story? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> at, 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 the end of the, at the end of the story, Spidey is talking to the guys from the ad agency – He's like, you know, I got a great idea for an ad campaign. <laughs> <laughs> so, and the timing of it, of when the Spider-Mobile came out and when those ads started, it was, the synchronicity was beautiful. So Spider-Man in the Marvel Universe created the Twinkie ad campaign. That's Absolutely. Um, that we had all these bits and pieces. But, like, it, people say, like, what are your favorite things you've ever written for Spider-Man? And, and honestly, uh, you know, the Marcus Martin issues are way up at the top. Cool. Yeah. Um, and that's, and especially the one that, that's out today is one of my all time favorites. Oh, awesome. And we saved, we saved it for last. We specifically saved it for last. Um, and I made Marcos hasn't done interior work, interior work for Marvel for years, years. And whenever he came back to do interior work, it was rare. Um, and the last time he came back and did interior work, I and we're buddies. I talk to him on Skype all the time. Uh, a lot of times when I'm stuck on a story, he sees it all so visually, so perfectly. If I'm stuck, and since he's in Spain, I'm on Skype. If I'm doing an all nighter, sure. I he's up. Sure. So I call him and go, you know, Marcos, I'm stuck. I've got this character over here doing this. I don't know how to pull this off. And he's like, What if you did that? Because he can see it all visually, and I'm like, Oh, that's good. Cool. cool. Yeah, so we talk all the time. So I got him to promise after he came back and did his previous last interiors that, and this was years ago, that he would come back for my final issue. Um, And he did. That's awesome. So that's 801. But like one of my favorite things, you're like, what what are your favorite moments? And definitely in my top three is in uh, Spidey Torch, um, in the Spider Mobile issue. Um, when they originally created the spider mobile, it's not till later the terrible tinkerer upgrades it so it can go up walls. Right, right. The original spider mobile could not go up walls. It's a doom buggy. It was just a doom buggy with extra doohickeys attached okay, to it. Okay. It did not have wall crawling power. So our story actually involved the red ghost stealing this anti- well, the human torch. The reason why the Red Ghost wants the Spider-Mobile is the Human Torch was trying to figure out how to make it go up walls. And he and Spidey stole one of Reed's inventions that affected gravity. So the two of them are like goofing around in this Spider-Mobile that can drive up the side of walls. But only for the duration of that story because we played fair with continuity. Okay. By the end, they have to give Reed his invention back. <laughs> so at the, at the end of the story... Reed, they're, they're like promising Reed to give him the the invention back because um, yeah, the Red Ghost doesn't care care about stealing the Spider Mobile. He wants the invention that inside it. Um, uh, Sp- you know, Spidey's like Reed, Reed. Can I can I just have it for just a couple more hours? <laughs> <laughs> and Johnny's like, Come on, Reed, let him have it. He's like, Okay, I'll bring it right back. I promise. And we're like, What's Spidey gonna do? And it's the last shots of the issue is you see J. Jonah Jameson, like with Daily Bugle crushed in his hand, Jonah, you know, yelling, you wall crawling menace, you. He's just like yelling and furious. And he's he's like leaning out a window and Robbie Robertson is holding him for dear life so he doesn't fall out. And he's just like, and and you pull back and it's this giant shot of Spider-Man in the Spider-Mobile doing donuts up the side of the Daily Bugle <laughs> <laughs> and just going, Wee! 
It's fantastic. <laughs> Absolutely. And Jonah's like, get off my building. <laughs> That's cool. Now, wasn't Marcos, like, wasn't Marcos an artist during when Johnny was dead? Uh, yeah, yeah. We did. Um, we I loved it so much. We did a story called Torch Song. Or, uh, where it, Marcos did all the uh, bridging sequences and guest artists like Ty Templeton and uh, Stefano Caselli um, came in yeah. and did short stories. Uh, and each short story was Spidey, one of the members of the FF, and Johnny having an adventure. Yeah. So yeah. it was Spidey Ben and Johnny, Spidey Sue and Johnny. Uh, Spidey Reed and Johnny, yeah. and it brought, yeah. and they're all reminiscing now that Johnny has passed away. Yeah. All, they're all having coffee at the Baxter Building and talking. And at the end of that story, uh, you see Johnny's holographic will, where he bequests, uh, he bequeaths Spidey um, his family. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yes. Have, have my spot on the team. Oh yes. This is, I, this is what I leave you: the greatest thing I have, not my sports cars or this or that. It's the, I'm leaving you the best part of me, I, you know. Yeah, no, that Be, see that's yeah, yeah Danny. You see that's those are the that's when deaths are handled well in comics, and we all know everyone's coming back. But you, if you didn't do that occasionally, you miss moments like that. You miss real character moments like that. And Hickman certainly had a lot of great things in his. Obviously, it was part oh, of his okay. FF run. Good lord, when uh, when the thing can't handle it, and it's Thor, the Hulk, and maybe Hercules. And just mm-hmm. they let they let the thing just beat the hell out of them to get his aggression out, and it ends with the thing sobbing in the Hulk's chest, and they're all just like standing around there, like consoling the thing. It's it's and and like you said, the will moment and stuff. No, those I'm misting up even talking about it. Shame on me. We okay. Here here's a behind the scenes secret. Jonathan and I had talked about how because I pitched to Jonathan. Um, when, when he told the, the story three to the room at a retreat, I said to him, how would you like it if Johnny leaves his spot to Spidey? You know, how would you like it if Spidey, you know, became part of the FF? And um, Hickman really liked yeah. it. And he, went, can, and he was like, can I do that? And I'm like, yeah, I'd love it. And that's kind of. Because from his point of view, he's thinking, this is great. I get Spidey in my book all the time. And from my point of view, I was thinking, this is great. Whenever I want, I can bring the FF in. Of course. So it was it was, it was very much a win-win. And Jonathan's very easygoing. He's very, um, yeah, you, you do your thing. I'll do my thing. This is great. He's like that about everything. Yep. And yep. Um, at one point we were talking, and I said, I want to do this thing with Johnny's where, where you see – a message on a hologram for Johnny's will. And Jonathan's like, I'm doing the exact same thing over in FF. And I'm like, should we sync up how we're doing this? And Jonathan's like, no, no, don't worry. I'll do my bit. You do your bit. It'll be fine. The the two different messages or it's our different interpretation. You know, it's fine. Well, Torch Song gets ready to go. And FF had just left house to the printer the week before. Now, I'm off, you know, putting this all in a circle. Uh, This is when I was doing my trip in Australia. So I'm doing a con in Australia. And just out of pure luck, um, I had eaten something weird, and it really got to me, and I was up at, like, 3 in the morning. So I'm up in Australia at, like, 3 in the morning. I'm like, I don't know how, you know, time and space has no meaning in Australia. I don't know if you're the day before, the day after, you know, I I don't know how it works. yes. It's some crazy – the time differential is insane. So from my point of view, it might have been like a Saturday at 3 in the morning and or you know whatever or a Thursday at 3 in the morning. I don't know how it works. And in Marvel, it was Friday and they were getting the book out. It was end of the day. And I just happened to be up at the right time and I was on my email. I was just checking emails and I see all these messages from the office. Like, we're, you're in Australia, we're probably missing you, we're sorry, we just didn't want this to be a surprise. And what happened was, Tom Brevoort was reading the book out. We, we at Marvel, lots of, they, they switch it up so that lots of different people read any one book out who are never involved in it. So you can have a complete fresh set of eyes to see if there's any kind of problem. 
So that issue had been so many people in the spider unit had read it. Everyone was good with it. The things about the leave and Tom happens to be one of the people who's reading it out. And he, and he is the FF editor and he sees the holographic message. And he goes, that's not the holographic message. Jonathan wrote. Oh no. So he's like, this can't, no Marvel universe. It's all a tapestry. It's all a puzzle. It all has to fit. So Tom had them strip all of my Johnny dialogue out from that scene and put in all the Jonathan dialogue from, from the, the Jonathan right, holographic right. message. And Jonathan's language is lyrical. It's poetic. It's beautiful. And my comic book dialogue is like Stan Lee dialogue. <laughs> you know, it's, it's bombastic and over the top. You know, I'm going to hit you with this lamppost and it's going to hurt. You know, it's whatever. <laughs> it's, yeah. So that was the it, final it, thing? It, they they used Jonathan's uh, dialogue? I see this at three in the morning. The book is going to leave in like a half an hour or something. It's going to leave. And I'm and I get on the phone. I'm like, fuck. Sorry, I don't care swear. if there's little kids. You can kids say fuck. It's okay. Yeah. You're like, fuck the phone call. How much it costs to call America? I'm calling America. I'm like on the phone with people on my dime. <laughs> Going, no, this can't run this way. This cannot run this way because it read like that Simpsons episode, like meet my good friend, Mr. Blark. <laughs> Cap Krusty. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah. You, you read all this Dan Slott dialogue. Blah, 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 blah. And then you hit this beautiful Jonathan Hickman dialogue. <laughs> and then it goes back to Dan Slott dialogue. And you're like, oh, my God, that reads for crap. You're, you're killing my story. And Tom's giving me the big message about, no, this is the Marvel Universe. And this is – I'm like, there's one message. I'm like, but what if it's a special message just for Johnny? John, the Johnny left just for Peter. It's an addendum. It's a completely different message. He's not saying goodbye to the whole family. It's a completely different message. I'm like, yeah, the book's got to leave. I'm like, we're now at 20 minutes. I'm like, what, what, what if it's a different message? And he's like, okay. I'm like, none of the dialogue you saw earlier, a completely new message. And he's like – how would that read? And I'm like, <laughs> like this. <laughs> Seriously. I'm like, I type it out in real time as fast as I freaking can. And, and that was, uh, that's what saw print. That's good. Well, that's good. And now I want, yeah, they go ahead. They rushed lettering. They completely relettered two pages within like 20 minutes with all that. People are like, oh, I love that dialogue. It's so heartfelt. It was so beautiful. I'm like, I wrote that in Australia with, with, with like my tummy rumbling and on a phone costing like $20 a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so that thing could leave and it all would have like my tenor and voice throughout it. Uh, and it wouldn't just be this weird Mr. Black. <laughs> that is one of the best things. <laughs> Mr. Black. Hello, I'm Mr. Black. Thank you, Krusty. Yes. Uh, yes. The, it, the, the modern day version is uh, Captain America doing the PSA. That's true. <laughs> like, pointing to, like, my friend, your gym teacher, and he's on the wrong side of the, the TV. Animal screen. Burris, absolutely, which was fed, such great casting in uh, Homecoming. That's abs- He's so great. Uh, I love that guy. Yeah, I, I, he's a war criminal now, but who cares? <laughs> <laughs> now, I meant to ask, mentioning Brevoort. What uh-huh. is your count of Spider-Man issues the same as Tom's? Because I've had this conversation with Bendis where Tom doesn't count oh, annuals. Oh, Tom doesn't oh, count oh, special oh, issues. Oh, oh. I, I, when you say I've had the, what you really mean is what is the Bendis count? Because I love, I love Brian, but Brian counts every part of the Buffalo. Well, wait a minute though. I, well, if it's a, if it's an Brian, issue, you've Brian, written Spider-Man. Brian, no, no. Brian counts every part of the Buffalo. I love him very much. <laughs> But, but Brian's like, you know, if 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 he wrote, you know, Spider Man dialogue that appeared in a video game handbook, that counts. You know, that counts. All right. Okay. All right. You know, Brian, I love Brian, but he's like, are you counting my Ultimate Spider Man team up issue? This I'm like, no, no, I'm not. Hilarious. Hilarious. <laughs> now, conversely, yeah, because I do the whole thing. I am I am religious, so like I've written. You know, uh, tons. I've written a bunch of uh, amazing full issue Amazing Spider Man free comic book day sure. issues, or a full issue of Amazing Spider Man the list, right? With Adam Cupid right. art, or or the Spidey Human Torch uh, stuff, yeah, 
the Spider-Man Human Torch, backups in old Venom comics, uh, Spider-Man Magazine for kids uh, from, you know, the 90s, uh, Ultimate Spider-Man cartoon comic. You know, I've, I've written Spider-Man in lots of different specials. When you add up all the specials and sides and one-shots and minis, uh, it, it comes out to something like 36 extra issues. Okay. But I don't count them. Okay. Uh, the... the Single issues, non-annual single issues of the core Spider-Man title. That's amazing. The thing yeah. that for that for that month, Spider-Man, Marvel Comics is saying this is the Spider-Man title. Uh, that comes out to uh, 180 as of today. Only 180. That's shocking. Only, only 100 if you play fair. Okay. <laughs> It's 180. If you want to play unfair, it gets up to like uh, over 260. Well, I hope so. Yeah, I figured over 200 or something like that. Now, it, I, I I get easily over 200 if you if you start using Bendis. Man. Okay, so you're at 180. I don't know what. Do you know the numbers? It's like the home run leaders of all time in baseball, where it's like, all right, it's you know, it's uh, it Barry right, Bonds, work- then it's uh, then it's Hank Aaron, then it's Babe Ruth, then it's Willie Mays. No one- no one will ever top Brian for the amount of time sure. he has been sure. on Spider-Man. It's 18 years? Yeah, yeah. 99 yeah. to, so, uh, yeah, 99 to 18. Yeah. Well, or, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Brian did 18 years of telling Spider-Man yeah. stories. Now, if you went on comic books that star Peter Parker, Spider-Man, no one would, or, or that the appearances of Peter Parker, Spider-Man, no one will ever, ever. You can genetically design someone, and they will never beat Brian Michael Bendis. He did eight years of like Spidey on the Avengers, right? right. You know, yeah. and eighteen years of Ultimate Spider-Man, yes, and uh, an ungodly amount of Spider-Man side projects. Sure. You know, no one will ever def- take that down. No one will ever take that away. If you do solo books that star Peter Parker, Spider-Man. Or, you know, and I'm not allowed to count superior. Um, <laughs> Brian, Brian, uh, I get really close. If it's just solo books starring Peter Parker, I get really close to, to knocking uh, Brian off the pedestal of that specific statistic. Okay. Uh, but I don't hit it. And if I knew he was leaving, I would have stayed on longer. <laughs> I, I would have gone for that. I seriously would have gone for that. Now, if you're talking about the biological entity, <laughs> Peter Parker, if you want to split that atom, you know, if you want to get down to that finesse, you know, and, and count my superiors and not count his miles, you know, then I think I can take him. <laughs> But that that is threading such a needle that I go, yeah, I'm not doing. Dan, that. I don't know. That's I, I don't know. That's silly. I don't know if you're aware of this, but in the podcast comic book world, uh, one mm-hmm. of a very a very popular comic book show discussed your run of Spider Man. It was four hosts, and mm-hmm. and one host is like, you know, I think I've had enough of Dan Slot Spider Man, and certainly there, oh. I'm sure that there have been fans. I'm sure there are men. Yeah, well, and, and fine, whatever. But it was really I, great. I, I, am, I am sure there are legions. But it was really great to hear the <laughs> other three go, now wait a minute, and really kind of examine, and this was years ago. This was several years ago, probably before <laughs> 2015, probably around 2012, something like that. And they're like, now hold on. And it was this very nuanced discussion of, Dan did this. Dan did that. Dan, and it's like you've got to say that Dan is one of the most significant Spider-Man writers and is deserving to be discussed among Bendis, Roger Stern, obviously Stan, and 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 it was really a pleasure to hear this discussion. And and he and he conceded, but it did uh, still bother him, and ultimately he left the podcast, which cracked no, me up. No, 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 no it's no. okay. He's fine. He's it's okay, Uncle oh, Larry. The, the 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 dog's okay. He didn't die. It's okay. <laughs> no, I I I, I will get like uh, every now and then like a fan who uh, goes, "I am so mad at you for killing Peter Parker. I'm just so mad." I'm like, you know, he came back. Yeah, but I'm still mad sure. that he died. Sure. And you're like, he came back. Well, but you killed him. But he came back. Well, and I'm glad. Yeah, um, that was. I mean, Superior. It really was 
man, I I I know you went through a lot, uh, both positive and extreme negatives. That was really crazy, and I'm glad you stuck with it and told your story. And and it's a, it's one of the great runs. People, the sales on that book, and was I'm never reading Spider Man again. You were reading the book because <laughs> our, our sales popped up higher than they had ever been for my entire run, you know, up to that point. That was the thing that popped up the sales. Uh, you know, we had however many people said, well, I left the book and I, I'm serious and here's my receipts and here's my empty long box of comics I didn't buy. The, the, uh, uh, for those guys, if they left, then you know what? For every one of you that left, a hundred jumped on. I believe it because uh, it, the sales just really like that's where they popped up, and they never kind of went back down from the moment. You know, they they kind of fluctuate with the industry, but from the moment we uh, hit ASM seven hundred and then went right into Superior One, from that moment on, Spider Man had been uh, Spider uh, the Marvel superhero flagship. That's awesome, as it should. That, no, but it's not always. I like we well, grew up, sure. we grew up in an era where where Burn Claremont X Men. Of course, king. of course. You know, and and there's a generation where Brian's Avengers is king. certainly, and there's an and it goes. There's always like a we've seen times where even you know stuff like you go what that was king yeah Jeff there's a time when Jeff Loeb's Hulk. Was sure the leader. There is a time when um, Straczynski's Thor was the leader. Yes. The, the, it, there's different times where different things become where they spike, and they are the flagship. And yet, and yet, uh, with DC, I mean, I, you know, Green Lantern. I'm certain was probably you know right there, Batman. but it's always Batman. Just Batman. It's always Batman. But with Marvel, there are times where different things rise to become the flagship for a good stretch. And it really was ASM 700 that popped us up. Now, I'm threading the needle a little because I'm saying Marvel superhero flagship because there is a stretch while it still remains the superhero flagship. There was a good, healthy chunk where Star Wars was Well, yes, and I'm aware of that. And I've heard others say the same thing, that Marvel currently Marvel's two biggest sellers are Deadpool and Star Wars. Um, That's – Or has that changed? Like a year. That's changed. there you go. So – it, it it's always it always flux it's always in flux, um, but for for since seven hundred since seven hundred all the way through Superior, all the way through uh, Worldwide and so on and so on. There are times where something a new number one comes out and it spikes sure. up. Well, sure. Or, or there's a special anniversary issue that spikes, but for the most part, it's been Spidey's been the flagship since Superior. So people are like, say what you want. About, oh, I left for Superior. Either one, no, you didn't, and you were still reading it. Or two, for you leaving, a hundred other people jumped in. Because that's when it suddenly went, boom. <laughs> um, and I personally think it was Stegman. <laughs> <So, laughs> no, that, that's, that's the other way I've just been the luckiest bastard on this book. That I have worked with Umberto Ramos. I've worked with Ryan Stegman, Stefano Caselli. I've worked with uh, I, McNiven did like my opening arc. I've worked with John Jr. on New Ways to Die, on Amazing 600. I've got to work with the incredible Stuart Eminem. Yep. Uh, oh my God. You know, Marcos Martin. Um, one after another, I have worked with such a, a, a rich wealth of co-creators who have worked with me. And it's one of the things that's frustrating in this industry now. Um, Mike Allred and I were lucky. We got to do uh, Silver Surfer from start to finish and be a team and, and be comrades in arms. And this was our book. Yes. That is not Slot's Silver Surfer. You know, I've seen people do that. I like slot silver server. It's not. It is slot and all red silver server. Man. It is all red and slot, slot and all red. This is two creators working hand in hand, lovingly putting this book out. And he gets to have as much, if not more, ownership of that. And you don't get that nowadays with artists. That if you're Umberto Ramos and you are working your ass off, 
on on Amazing Spider-Man. Well, you know what? Next week, Giuseppe Comicoli is in, and he's working his ass off. You know, everyone's – and it's frustrating. You know, I, people want to have a sense of ownership. People want to go, this is my run of this book. And we're in an era now where writers get to do that and artists don't. And some of that – someone had a thing online um, where they showed side by side a picture of how Captain America's boots are drawn <laughs> – and how they were drawn in the 70s and how they're drawn now. And then there's a subtitle of, this is why artists only can do eight issues a year. <laughs> because you see Captain America's boots and it's like, you know, it's like 18 lines max shows you a buccaneer boot in a, in a beautiful, you know, John Senior style. Right. You know, and it's crisp and it's beautiful and it's, it's Captain America's boot. And then you see a Captain America boot the way it's drawn by like a McNiven or a hitch where you can see every seam on the boot and every crevice in, in the, um, the soul, you know, and you go, Oh my God, that's why it takes these books so long to be drawn. These guys are spending an hour drawing caps boot. And the other guy, whoosh. <laughs> yeah. You know, because people were, people like the cartoon, the simple style The what I love about Marcos Martin is how many lines has he drawn on a page? But every line is the perfect line. Every line is the line you need and no more. And people look at that and go, well, that's cartoony. No, that's that. You, you, there's a guy who did a, a either a blog or a YouTube or a thing that was making the rounds. And it, was, it wasn't a YouTube of like, you know, a fan having their YouTube channel, which is great. Fan has their YouTube channel, and they every week they tell you what they think. This was like a YouTube from like a site, you know, like one of the big sites. Okay, okay. so it's there that sites you do, it, and their comic expert comes on, and they did a a thing about why they don't, you know, why Chris they don't like Chris Samney and Chris. Well, they did they went through a whole bunch of artists, and they kind of rated them, and they they slammed Chris Samney, saying it was cartoony and bad and childish and amateurish and every comic artist in the world rose up good with with pitchforks going you don't get it you know like no samney is an artist he's a genius i'm looking at a chris samney dan dare that he did yeah no and it's one of my favorite pieces on my wall right now so go on yeah There, there are you know chris samney puts up a piece and you watch as like if it's like a virtual museum, all the patrons who come by to admire it, like the first wave of everyone surrounding this piece in the virtual museum of the Internet to stroke their chins and their hearts swell and their eyes mist. <laughs> and they're all artists. Yeah, man. Like the first wave of people, they can't wait to see the new Samney piece. You know, oh my God, look, here's Jamal Eigel, and here's, yes. here's this guy, and here's that guy. They're all lining up to go to go at the altar of Samney because it's beautiful. Well, he was part of that. It, he was part of that group that would do weekly, uh, or either weekly or daily, like their warm ups, and someone would call <laughs> out like, "All right, Doom Patrol," and it was Gabe Hardman, and it was Chris, and it was. I, I, and shame on me for not remembering more artists. Uh, yeah, no, but you'd have like Doc Shane. Yes, and you'd have all yes, these, Doc. Like, why not Ringo? Just be in awe. Like I loved when, like Ringo, God bless yes. him, when Ringo was doing his warm up sketches, and you'd see like every day he'd do like a new sketch, and you'd be like, oh, oh my god, my heart, this is perfect. Yes. Um, uh, no, I, yeah, you, I'm glad you, you mentioned Ringo, man, because I he's I always say, and I don't even think he knew it. But he's he kind of was the patron saint of Word Balloon, where he was like one of those early creators that was like, "Hey, I love what you're doing. I can't get you just interviewed Jeff Parker, and this was very early Jeff Parker in uh, Inner Man, his uh, creator owned uh, bit, and he's like, I can't I can't download it? Can you help me?'" I'm like, uh, could, "Could you come on my show?" And he's like, "Oh yeah, sure." And then we talked, and he's and I'm like, every now and then I would email him I'm like, "How am I doing? Am I doing all right?" I'm like, "Any?" I, I'm like, "I want your." input because i really respect you and let me know how i'm doing on the podcast and stuff and he was seriously i always anytime i can uh point that out and and pay tribute to ringo because he he was he was amazing he's 
one of the nicest people and, and one of the most talented too. Uh, oh my god! Uh, I'm as I'm getting ready for FF. Um, I'm I'm been rereading runs and you know, uh, yeah, that you know, there's the Hickman run. Sure, fraction two. There, there, the the ones that that resonate the most with me. You know, I love Hickman's run. I love, um, you know, the, one, there's Stan and Jack. There's well, nothing touching Stan. That's the classic. It, you know, that, that is the fantastic. Absolutely, man. Run. It just is. And then everyone who follows, you know, the ones that I, I treasure the most are the Wade Ringo and the Burns. Well, sure. Absolutely. The, the, yeah. Those those are my standard. Those are my you know. I love Walt Simonson's run. Yeah. I love I love Hickman's run. I love Dwayne McDuffie's run. The but but there's some magic going on with with Wade Ringo and with Byrne, where it's just I can just stay in that zone. I can read those books and reread those books and re- I can just go in a loop. If if those and the Stan and Jacks or the Jack and Stans were the only. I would be content. I understand. You know, I totally understand. Th- that's the, the Wade Ringo. Uh, well, and also for it, it to have that ridiculous stop for a second that, um, and now I'm blanking, the publisher that isn't there anymore. Hmm? Uh, the Mar- Cross. What was it again? Cross Gen. No, no, no. Uh, the, uh, no, Marvel's uh, publisher when uh, he and uh, Joe. Were, oh, oh, oh uh, Bill yeah, Jemis. Bill Jemis. You know, it's like, yeah, let's do something different. And it's like, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, for for all of that, you know, you still get um, Roberto Segura Gossett. Yes. Uh, you know, look at what he's well, brought to well, the world. Exactly, the genius behind Riverdale. No, 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 like absolutely, man. Riverdale re- reinventing Archie. You know, improving Spider Man. Turn off the dark by five hundred percent. The <laughs> he uh, and away from him. Guy. Genius writer. This guy. You know, it's it's tough, man. Some jobs you get. Oh, sure. You know, well, that's not his fault. No, that's yeah. why. That's why I say no. It was it was Jemis. It was Bill saying, "Now let's do something different." <laughs> okay, now now I'm on a tight. No, no, no. This is me talking. This is me talking. Uh-huh. But no, I want to. All right, well, here we'll get off that because I want to ask. Uh, you mentioned Immanuel, and uh, yeah. oh my now, god! Oh, when, 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 whenever Immanuel art comes in, or whenever stuff gets in, one things that like really astonished me, like we were talking about, like. Everybody lining up to look at Samney. To a man, every single person, you know, who who, who approaches me and like Eminem is their like their rock god of comics. He is right. like all the artists are like they feel okay. Like the way I used to think about it is whenever I'd read a you know as a fan when you know especially when I was just starting to write and just starting to get things published. When at the, in that time zone, whenever I would read a Mark Wade comic, I would feel inspired to write a comic. I, hear you. Yeah. I would be like, "Oh, the the passion, the energy, like the Return of Barry Allen storyline." You know, I would read this stuff, and I'd be like, "Oh my god, I feel inspired." Whenever I would read a Paul Dini story, I would feel inspired. Like I want to write comics, and then whenever I'd read a Neil Gaiman or Alan Moore story, I would want to slit my wrists. I'm like, I will never be that good. Oh, my God. This is perfection. I've looked upon the face of a deity, and now I weep. Like, I, that's it. I'm walking away. <laughs> so sometimes you look at brilliance, and it inspires you. And sometimes you look at brilliance, and you feel like yeah, crap. It intimidates you, certainly. <laughs> it's just like, I remember I did a, a Superman adventure story. It is, I think it's like one of my only times in print where I did a standalone Superman story by myself. Like, I co-wrote uh, with Ty Templeton. I, uh, I would have him show up in Justice League Adventures, and I, and, and I did a Justice League uh, arc where he'd get to be with other heroes. But I did my one and only standalone Superman by myself, and I was so happy with it. And it was a story that uh, was told from four points of view. But it wasn't Rashomon. It wasn't like someone's lying, but it was told from four very specific points of view. And by having the four stories blend together, you saw the the true story. You you saw the bigger picture. 
and also every character walked away from all four stories changed. So it's like this is and it was kind of like what Superman means to me. And I was so happy with this story and I was probably showing it to everybody. And the same week it came out, Alan Moore did an eight page story where he told the story from four points of view from four different time frames, all on one page where all four panels may built physically a building and they all weave together in like an Escher like pattern. And I was like, Oh fuck you. (laughs) (laughs) You're like, go to hell. (laughs) He's a chess master and you're playing tiddlywinks. I understand. I'm really, I'm digging my little precious flower. Put it on your refrigerator. Please like it. (laughs) And here is the Renaissance painting. (laughs) But I I wanted to ask about Stuart because immediately after 800 comes out, he makes his announcement. I broke him. Yeah. (laughs) Did you, did he, are the indication? Did he, did he say anything to you? I, I made that joke. Did someone like, like when I saw that, I was like, but it, w- it was very much a self-deprecating well, sure, kind of thing of where like, where I, I, it wasn't really like a joke for like someone, you know, like Stuart imminent, like they passed the news on to me is retiring. I'm like, Oh my God, I broke him. <laughs> <laughs> like, he didn't break him. He's fine. You know, he, he's taking a break from monthly comics. I'm like, it was 800. I broke him. Yeah, I broke him. And then I'm like, when I finally got like, okay, okay, all right, it's all right, write an email, everything's great, and, you know, and and then I get this instant message from a friend, and they're like, did you break Stuart in? And then, <laughs> <laughs> so you have talked I, to him since, the announcement. Oh, I haven't, uh, just, just well, email. Sure. Uh, the... Uh, I'm, I'm, all the art for 800 was just, oh, oh yeah, man. so, oh, no, it was epic. but it was all, from everyone across oh, the board, uh, but it, we gave him the, the big giant, uh, big screen finale, you know, for the, the actual Spidey Red Goblin fight from the moment it kicks off where it's him and Spidey alone to the moment it ends, all stored him and then 28 pages Gorgeous. Um, I, I own a page. Of oh, that's that. fantastic. Excellent. I, I own a page. Uh, it's my, it is one of my favorite pages of the issue where it's, uh, and Stuart Eminem is so good. I had the, uh, Joan, uh, spoilers if you haven't read 800. Um, oh my God, turn it off now. We're balloon people. I'm about to spoil. Uh, spoilers. Uh, Jonah has just taken a shot at the Green Goblin and Spidey has just dodged in the way of the bullet, taken the bullet for the Green Goblin. And uh, you, Stuart is such a god. He went this. I wrote that as like a three or four panel page. And Stuart is like, no, Spidey taking the bullet should be like a splash. And he rejiggered the pacing so that you got that and he, Oh my God, he was right. And then you flip the page and it's not the splash. It's the page after the splash that it's just, it's Jonah going, what, why, why would you? And Spidey cuts him off holding his, holding his arm over the bullet wound going, and you can see the enough of the mass is ripped away. So you can see the condemning look from Peter Parker's eyes going, um, because I, because I could, it meant I had to, because wow. of great power, there must always come great responsibility, even to the worst of us. Yeah. And it's like, I love that page. <laughs> I just, you know, I, it's not when, when he's swinging, it's not when he's punching. It's not, it's when he's being Peter Parker. It's when he's being spite. There, there's a, there's a sequence in the um, the opening of the uh, the go down swinging arc um, that means the world to me, where you see in two instances in there they're juxtaposed. Most people don't put it together. Hopefully, it works on a level that you know you're you're just reading it and you're absorbing it. I don't want it to be so blatant, but. Jonah has uh, Jonah's tied up in the chair. You don't know it's Jonah yet. And 
Norman Osborn is interrogating him. And we need to see that he's cruel and he's heartless. And he's not just cruel and heartless. Uh, he's a monster. He's, he's just a monster. And he picks up a rat, you know, that's squeaking on the floor and he picks it up and he bites off the head. He's, he's like the, he's intimidating the hell out of whoever's in that chair. And he's being an insane lunatic about it. Like he's telling you, if you, you know, and he realizes he made the wrong metaphor. <laughs> you know, no, no, I want you to squeal. This didn't work at all, did it? <laughs> I, I bit the rat because it was squealing. But you get the message. I'm an insane lunatic. Talk. <laughs> and then you cut to a Spidey scene where a woman is getting her purse snatched. Spidey webs the guy and sends him whee, up onto the lamppost. And the guy is now hanging there. And Spidey's on the ground. And the guy, at Spider-Man's mercy, hanging from the web, goes, what the hell, Spidey? You know, you know, we've done this a bunch of times. You know I got a rotator cuff injury in this arm. I'm going to be in PT for weeks. <laughs> and Spidey's like, oh, Jimmy, man, I'm sorry I didn't see it was you. Next time I'll, I'll, I'll get you in the square of the back. I won't do it by the arm. I'm really sorry. <laughs> and then he goes, wait a minute. What am I doing? There isn't going to be a next time. Jimmy, give the lady her purse. You know, and the guy, you know, the guy throws down, the purse, like, so, tell her you're sorry. Sorry. And the lady's like, you punch him sometimes. He's like, like he's a pinata. You punch him. He's like, lady, I promise next time I'll punch. <laughs> and he's like, and he's getting ready to go, and and Jimmy, whoever the guy Jimmy is, hanging from the web, goes, "And Spidey, a uh, favor?" He's like, "What?" He's like, "Last time you left me like this, some kids took my shoes. <laughs> like, can you web them to my feet?" He's like, "Fine, thwip, thwip." <laughs> and he goes, and you're like, "There you go." Norman eats the rat. Spidey's being a Spidey hey, in New York. Hey, exactly. yo, hey, Spider Man, even in the bad guys. Yeah, how's your mother? <laughs> you know, it's, I just love that. You, man. you know, like, everyone's like, whenever they talk about the Straczynski run, like, they talk about Aunt May discovering a secret identity. They they talk about, you know, leaving the plaque for Gwen Stacy. They, they talk about all these great warm moments. And the moment for me where I, I, I just, that I love, that whenever I think about Straczynski, it's like Spidey's dealing with whatever problem he's dealing with, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And and he's just thinking about it, and he's he's doing the equivalent of pacing, where he starts walking down the side of a building, <laughs> and he's he's walking the way we walk when we walk down the street. He's not wall crawling, and he's just kind of walking. And there's a guy on his fire escape eating a bag of popcorn, you know. And Spidey's thinking and mumbling out loud about whatever he's got to do, and. And is, he passes the guy, the guy on the fire escape, just standing there now at the wrong angle. Goes to Spidey like, uh, you want some popcorn? <laughs> and Spidey's like, is salted or it's kettle corn? Oh, yeah. And then the next shot is Spidey and he's got the whole bag. And he's got the mask up and he's just munching on popcorn. And he's still thinking about the sure. problem. And then you cut back to the guy who now doesn't have popcorn. Who just stand in there? Who just had this weird New Yorker sure. moment? And he goes, "I love this town. <laughs> <laughs> that that is fantastic." I hear you, man. There's there's all these moments where you want there to be moments, and a big problem of working on Spidey is uh, the way it is now. We were talking about artists having ownership. Mm -hmm. One of the I would my run on Spidey has been a monkey's paw. You know, I got my wish. I got to be the writer on Spider-Man. I, I I could not have a better life. I could not. This is what I wanted. Did I want to be on the on the stage of the Oscars accepting best writer or best actor and giving the big speech? Did I have that fantasy? Sure. Did, did, did I did I have the fantasy of like, and you got the winning goal or you did this <laughs> or you did that. You get the Nobel Prize. Yeah. Those are all great. We've all had those fantasies. You know, everyone's sung into the hairbrush, sure. pretending they're a rock star. But my number one thing 
number one with a bullet more than anything in this universe. I wanted to write Spider-Man. That was it. And I, I got to have that dream for ten and a half years. Now I'm the, I am fine. I hear you. <laughs> and I had my time and I am fine. Um, but that was my dream. But the monkey's paw of it is I would have loved the world where I got to do one Spider-Man comic a month. I just got to do one a month and I could craft it like a little jewel and send it off, you know, you know, like, like Moses down the reeds. <laughs> just, there you go. There you go, little story. I hear you. But don't yeah. you also think, I, oh, I'm sorry. I mean, it did step on you. Are you some more? Yeah. Know, I, that, that would have been, that would have been the ultimate, you know, that would have been, but to get this, to do this, to have the privilege and honor uh, of, of being the guy writing Spider-Man, I had to do this bizarre mix of being Lucy wrapping chocolates. Yes. Yes. You know, at the got factory. Yeah, got to make the donuts, and, yes. And being the guys from OK Go jumping from treadmill yes. to treadmill. <laughs> I had, it was – it was two magic treadmills because they got to come out, got to come out, got to come out. You, you know, much like Wacker and that, that, you know, the month we did two and the next month we did five, yeah. you know, from then on, we every we did three every month and, and you got the correct amount of Spideys every month for 10 and a half years out of me. You, you know, they came out, they came out, they came out. You look at my She-Hulk run, we would do 12 issues and it would take us 14 months. Interesting. And no, no issue would come out on time on the week it was supposed to and Brevoort was going to kill me. You know, five issues of uh, Spider-Man Human Torch, they came out in six months. You know, four issues of Great Lake Avengers, they came out in five months. Like, I was always missing deadlines, uh, like, not deadlines, I was always, I was missing deadlines, but I was always missing the ship week by like a week you. or two weeks and it would add up and eventually you would lose a month. When you looked at the grand scheme and you look at run after run I was doing until I was on Spidey, every project I was doing, you could slap at the end of the uh, run. You could go, OK, you did those 12 issues, but it took you 13 or 14 months. Right. And there was none of that oxygen. There was none of that leeway. There was none of that stretch and give on Spider-Man, Spider-Man. Is Marvel's moneymaker? It, it, Marvel needs it for the budget. He, and when you're saying that, it's not people in this freaking Scrooge McDuck money bin. It's not about that. It's about keeping the lights on and keeping everyone on editorial and keeping the machine right. going. And if you start screwing up, people lose jobs. People don't get checks. You know, some some letterer who's lettering who needs there to be a script to letter. They've got kids. Yep. yep. You know, some colorist. Who's going to, you know, do this? They they have bills to pay. You have to – you're part of a team and part of that team means you need to be there for everybody. Sure. There's a lot of people depending on you and there are fans who want their books to be there when you promised. They want to go into that store and on the day that book is supposed to come out, they got in their car. They drove to that store. They don't have – all the time in the world, that book is supposed to be there that day. It should be there that day. So yeah. to make that machine work, you got to stick to those deadlines. You got to hit those, those markers. And so many times, John, you're, you're a sports yeah. fan. Um, you, you know, like, uh, the worst of all the, uh, the Kevin Costner baseball movies. <laughs> for the love of the game. There are for the love of the game. You get to that moment and for the love of the game where he has fucked up his hand and he's gone through the rehab and he is pitching his last ever game and he's pitching his no hitter and he is sucking because his body just can't do it. He's too old, but he has forged all these relationships with everyone on the team throughout the whole movie and they come up to him man to man and they go, we will get you your no yeah. hitter. John, John McGinley has we, that great speech. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, we will. We, you know, you just get it over the plate. We'll give you the note. We'll get you there. We love absolutely. you. Absolutely. We'll get you. I was that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Billy Chappell has that, to write a Spider-Man comic and has nobody backing him up, and then he finds out he does. Uh, yeah, I was that guy, man. Letters, colorists, artists, everyone to get because I did this for ten and a half years. You know, people got, you know, they got me the no-hitter. 
um, you're a team. And sometimes, you know, that other guy is slipping up and you've got to work hard and you've got to do an all-nighter and you've got to do that thing. The book has to go. And the, the people that no one gives enough credit to it in all of this, well, it's really the letter. The letter just, oh, my God. The letter is do the yeoman's work. Um, and they just do not get the respect. And the editorial team, the editorial team just takes so much crap from the fans and from everybody. People have no idea what they do and how hard their job is and, and the sacrifices they make to get that book to you, you know, and to do so many. The guys at Marvel do so many more books than people from any other company per office. It's crazy. Um, but, yeah, part of the, the deal of doing this this book was I I had to be writing Spider-Man all the time, all the time. I loved it. But I'd be writing three storylines for three artists. Right. And I'd be writing chapter two of the first arc for one artist. And I'd be scripting chapter one of the second arc for the second artist. And I'd be plotting chapter three of the third arc of a different story for a third artist. And they're, but they're all going to line up and all the trains are going to come out on time that people don't understand that that was, that's the secret of Spidey. That's how the Spidey books work. And what it means is if I'm writing that first arc and I have that, that comes out before the other two and suddenly I get the inspiration, I get the idea of, wouldn't it be interesting if the story started going this way instead? (laughs) I can't, I can't do that. I can't make this is on tracks and it has to line up with the next sure. train. The sure. only story I can do that with is the is the third story. So every now and then I would get the freedom to do that. But anyone else telling the monthly book has the freedom to do that after every issue. Um, and I, I so that's a bit of a straight jacket. And that's the monkey's paw that I, I, I got to write Spider-Man, but I didn't have the freedom to to suddenly explore things. And a lot of times the moments that would have to fall on the cutting room floor because you have to hit all your plot points or you didn't hit everything you needed to hit. So you have to sacrifice a scene. The scenes I would end up sacrificing all the time and it would kill me would be the equivalent of the JMS popcorn scene or the equivalent of Jimmy on the, the web, you know, hanging from the lamppost. You know, those are the scenes that would... And those are the moments that I remember the most uh, when we got to do them. Like there was a beat um, and you would see this. It was almost a trope. It would happen so many times in the 70s. You would need to get a lot of info dump. So you'd need Spider-Man to literally have the Daily Bugle and read a story Mm -hmm. to give info dump to the reader. So they would always be – they'd always kill like three or four panels of – You'd see a news vendor and they'd be standing there and thwip, a web would come down and take a daily bugle. And then thwip, a web would come down and leave a quarter in the in the thing. <laughs> you saw that scene a lot. <laughs> and then Spidey would read the bugle to you. So you go, oh my God, Electro's out. <laughs> And there's a new there's a new museum experiment, a new museum thing about Tesla. You know, it was always like, you know what I mean? Like that was so many Spider-Man stories. And I did this one story where Peter was working at Horizon. And the idea was that, you know, for years, Peter would take photos of himself, sell them as the bugle, have that money, and that pays the rent. In the olden days, Spidey's going up against the vulture. Oh, my God, he needs to build a special doohickey to knock out his wings. And now he has to spend all this money. No. <laughs> so what I did in big time is Spidey has to build this thing to take out the vulture. Hey, I sell it to my lab. <laughs> it can also be used to make coffee. Well, I didn't know that. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> Yay, I made money. And then, and then doing all this science stuff, he eventually had the time to make discoveries. So I, I had that. The, I love this scene where you see the news vendor. And there's all the Daily Bugles and stuff. And the web, thwip, comes down and thwip, leaves a bill in the the stand. But he hasn't thwipped the Daily Bugle. It goes right past the Daily Bugle. And it hits the cover of Scientific America. Oh, that's awesome. 
and he pulls it up, and it's Spidey with Spider, and Peter Parker's on the cover for this new discovery. That's awesome. That's and then awesome. Spider Man goes running along the walls and jumping off of flagpoles and doing flips because he's happy to be alive. And this, he's so happy he got published in Scientific American. <laughs> This is like the happiest thing. And that tells you so much about his character and so much about the world of Spider-Man and so much about the specific world that you're in during the big time run. And that's the kind of scene that, oh, I was so happy it made it into the comic that I didn't have to cut it to show you how the lizard was escaping from a I prison. Absolutely. Yeah. But you got to show that lizard scene. Well, if course. you don't show the lizard scene, you're not ready for the next issue. Um, well, it, it's I'm it's tricky. I was gonna. I was gonna add to that, especially when you're talking about Horizon Labs, because uh, one of my favorite scenes, and we've talked about it in a previous word balloon, was uh, M A walking Peter to the the lab, and then looking to the sky and going, "See Ben, it worked out. He's doing what he's he's doing oh. what he should be doing." And it's it, no, those are the kind of quiet. That's much like uh, Batman to a degree, but really more Superman and the Daily Planet. The the supporting cast of Spider Man is so important to the story. And and it forms the character in and each character from Robbie to Jonah to, you know, Liz to everybody. You know, to the obvious of, of Aunt May and, and uh, Mary Jane and the like. It's no these the and especially several that you created yourself uh in your run as well. They inform the character. Well Spider Man has before you even get to me before you know, I'm not taking any credit Spider-Man has the best supporting cast in all of comics, and he has one of the three best rogues galleries in all right. of comics. That that you you know, Batman has the best rogues yes. gallery, hands down. No one beats Batman's rogues gallery. Uh, Spider-Man and the Flash have fantastic rogues sure. galleries. Um, I'm writing FF. FF has a fun rogues yes. gallery. They have. The best villain, sure. You know, Doom, FF yeah. at Doom. You know, oh my God, are you making Doom a villain? Read the book. <laughs> <laughs> Read the book. But we love everything that happened in Hickman's run. Read the book. Zdarsky's doing wonderful things with. Read the book. Okay. <laughs> the uh, you know FF. You know they've got Doom. They've got Galactus, and then they got these oddballs which are yeah, fantastic. The Red Ghost, perfect example. <laughs> Annihilus, sure. You know, the, the, the Psycho Man, Mole Man. They've got great rogues galleries. My problem with Iron Man, Iron Man, a tough. I am I am a Russian in a suit of armor. <laughs> I am the other Russian in a suit of armor. <laughs> Shut up! I am a Russian in a suit of armor. Come to me, capitalist pig dog. Let us fight the Cold War. Yeah, you know, yeah. That is yeah. Like, Oh, my God! Well, it was a product of its time, but no, you're right. And I've heard other uh, people say the same thing. Iron Man, it's tough. Not the best rogue he's gallery. Made, he's made of metal. Well, I shall fight you, for I am the Melter. You know? <laughs> the Melter. <that's laughs> like, the Melter. Oh, my God. I, you're in a giant suit of armor that's invincible. I have electric whip. Whiplash, I know. Wolf. Wolf. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Come at me, unarmored guy with two whips. <laughs> Good luck, buddy. <laughs> Who's the spy? Who's the corporate spy? Is it Spy Master? Oh, you you have Spy Master? No, the spies work. Well, sure. The, 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 guy, the guys who are just kick-ass cool spies? Well, the problem is the best one is now our own hero. Widow, of That's course, Widow. Of course. But, but Spy Master, Ghost, uh, the, the spies work. The spies totally work. The um, you just say they work for a different board power or they're freelancers or whatever, but Ghost and uh, Spy Master are cool. Um, there are cool guys. They're guys that are weird, and then they're guys where like if you come up with the right spin on them, if you come up on a new way to look at it, then you go, oh man, that's kind of cool. You, you know what I mean? Like they're guys that like it takes someone to come along and go, you know what? I'm going to make Kite Man cool. <laughs> Thank you, Tom King. You know, Absolutely. yeah. The, you can do it, man. You know, I, you're, you're talking to Johnny Squirrel Girl over Indeed. here. Indeed. You're talking, I, I did so much heavy lifting on Squirrel Girl. And you, the, 
But I am so proud that, you know, that I didn't write, you know, that Ryan and Erica, I, you know, whatever literal acorns <laughs> I left, they have made mighty oaks all their own and just blown everything else out of the water. They, they, they made Squirrel Girl an icon. I made her a reclamation project. They made, they made her, you know, a star in the firmament. So I, I look at that and I go, that's ah, awesome. Um, you know, I'll take whatever scrap of praise you're willing to throw out. But dear God, all the the gifs in the world of people standing up and clapping. That's for for uh, Ryan and Erica. Um, it's it's man, we live in a great time. At a boy, um, go on, I, I, go I look at the I look at the comics that are coming out. Uh, I am so you, you know what's you know what's amazing a comic everyone should be reading. The first issue was. It was a knock on the door with authority. It was it opened the door with authority. That I've been saying this for years. Al Ewing needed a flagship book. He needed a flagship character. Al Ewing would was off doing things in books that that did not have the 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 permanent flagship status of like. You know, there are characters. There, there is Iron Man. There is Captain America. There is Thor. There is Hulk. There, there are guys who've been with us, the X-Men. There are guys who've been with us forever. And, and we all know that, like, if, you're, if there's Avengers, but then you, you're a guy like me and you're working on Mighty Avengers, you're on the sister book. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. You're in an orbit. And people weren't giving Al the lead book. They weren't giving Al the, you control the franchise of this core Marvel character. And with his first issue of Hulk, oh my God, did he announce himself with authority? He does, he does everything Al Ewing has always been doing. Everyone needs to go back. If you, if you read, okay, one, you read Immortal Hulk, number one, my God, that's an incredible book. That is don't let anyone spoil it for you. There is a four page sequence. I'm not going to spoil it for you. It's a four page sequence. It is one of the best four page sequences in in a Hulk book you will ever read. You know, there are great Hulk runs. There are amazing Hulk artists and amazing Hulk writers all through the history of Hulk. There is a four page sequence that will forever be one of the best Hulk sequences. And you read it that fast. You read it that fast and it is in your brain for life uh, have you read no, Immortal I'm, Hulk I am one? kicking myself that I haven't picked it up yet I'm going to have to uh, correct Set. that today and uh, when I pick up my books sold out and gone to a well, second I'm going to have to pick it up digitally obviously or, 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 or no, no, no 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 read it in print read it in print read it in print um, <laughs> the, the, the thing the thing that I'm, I'm not you will not have the impact okay. digitally right. I, I hate it when I say stuff like this. Like I was saying this to people who are reading Silver Surfer 11. Read it in print. Read it in print. It's a book designed for print. Um, th- there is a sequence in in Immortal Hulk that I, I think about it and I go, if I read that on a screen, yeah, no, 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 no. you got to hold the comic in your hand. Um, I, I, I don't want to spoil. Um it was. I looked at. I was my jaw. I was just like, God damn, he's good. That's awesome. And the artist. I want to say Joe Bennett. Oh, Joe Bennett's um, awesome, of course. It, just yeah. killed, killed okay. on it. Uh, don't let anyone spoil. Right. Uh, that's there's like um, uh, someone's already like tweeted it out, and I just go, Ugh. I read it on Twitter, but uh, luckily that person doesn't have many followers. And it was done out of love that they read like digitally Spider-Man 801 last night. And I had this kind of fear that some asshole on a website <laughs> would post this one panel. Yeah. You know, like there's a panel that is earned in 801. And if you walk into 801 having read that panel ahead of time – your entire reading, reading experience has changed. You're not reading this, that story and then hitting that moment and experiencing it. You're reading the story and waiting for the moment to happen. 
And that's a different experience. You will have a different emotional experience reading the book. If you're waiting for a card you've already seen to be turned over, then the surprise and the feeling of turning over that card and experiencing it fresh, it's so different. And you will kill this story if you if you read that panel first and wait for it to come. Um, and somewhat, but it's it's the moment as a fan when you when you read the story and you hit that moment. It's the moment you want to share with everyone. Yeah. You know, I read this and I had experiences. I want to share this with you. I'm going to put this out into the digital world. And I'm sharing with you a gift by destroying that story experience for you. <laughs> <laughs> it comes from such a noble place. And it has such a terrible effect. I did. You know? John, I have to tell you, I heard this joke. I'm an alien from another planet, and I landed on Earth, and I've never heard this before. And, oh, this joke, to get to the other side, John, <laughs> to get to the other side, I laughed with my alien voice. Now let me tell you the joke. Why did the chicken, you're like, shut up! <laughs> No, I understand that. That's why I avoid I avoid the comic websites on Wednesday because I don't want to be spoiled. Yeah, man. Come see the great new feature. Hey, spoilers ahead. Empire Strikes. Yeah, come see the great new feature. Empire Strikes. I am your father. Back. Oh, good lord! Movies. It's it. even worse now. I mean, the day that yeah. Skyfall came out, Huffington Post mm. had. Isn't it a shame that M died? And it's like, go fuck yourself. Fuck yourself. Yeah. I love that brilliant movie called It's a Sled. <laughs> Best movie ever made. It's a sled. You're like, oh, you fucking prick. Not good. So you know, it's people. like. Uh... <laughs> which, which, by the way, the line has outlived the movie. And I always tell people, if you've never seen Soylent Green, you owe it to yourself. It's a great movie. And yes, you know uh, the uh, you know the line. It's it's such a great movie. Planet of It Was Earth All Along. <laughs> you know, I had Dana Gould on uh Boom, I'm sure you've read about it, is taking Serling's original screenplay and adapting it into a graphic novel, and Dana Gould's doing the adaptation. And I know he is like one of you know Dana Gould, of course. You're a Simpsons guy. Uh, one of the ultimate uh, Planet of the Apes fans, if you listen to his podcast, goes on for hours about how much he loves Planet of the Apes. So it's in good hands, and I had him on Word Balloon, and I'm very excited to uh, see beyond that screen test of Heston and um, Edward G. Robinson as Zayas. That's the only piece of the Serling script that we've seen, the original script. And it's a much more cerebral story than... You know, my God, look at these people. Or not, you know. <laughs> well, when uh, my parents used to live in Texas, and one day I was visiting them home from college, and my dad had the paper open, and it said that the um, the restored cut of uh, Lawrence of Arabia was playing. And I said, my, you know, I've never seen that. He's like, my dad was like, you have never seen Lawrence of Arabia. We're going to Lawrence That's of Arabia. four hours. Sit down, strap in, but it's amazing. Go on. Yeah. So I go and I see beautifully restored yes. cut. As it was originally intended for my first time. I'm watching Lawrence of Arabia. Woman sitting in front of me says to her friend, when you meet like the first guy, don't get attached to him. He gets Motherfucker. killed. Motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. Cause, but she's thinking everybody's seen Lawrence of Arabia. My second time watching Raiders of the Lost Ark forever burned in my memory. It was the second time I saw it. I had to run back and see it. But it was still like the first week it was out, right? And this was before VCR. So I'm like, I'm like, oh, this is the great. It, to this day, it is my favorite movie sure. of all time. I, I go see Raiders, my favorite movie, my favorite scene, favorite scene in all of motion picture history. Second time I'm seeing the movie, get up to the sword fight, and a woman goes, watch, he's going to get oh shot God. in the theater for the first week of the run. And I, But thank Christ it was my second yeah, time seeing it. No kidding. 
Oh my god! Uh, yeah, no, it's like my favorite moments in motion picture history. You know, shooting him, and it's all because Harrison Ford had malaria and was right. pooping. The the that's can we just shoot him? I got a gun. No, it's beautiful. Absolutely, it's a great. Jo- it's one of the best jokes in the movie. Absolutely, if not the best joke my, in the movie. At, at my three favorite moments in all of motion picture history, two of them are are improved on the spot. You know, and you'll never beat that. That's why, as a screenwriter, you're bummed because there's something. About, no, there's something about being in the moment and being there and being sure. on the set and and having the environment physically there that will create genius. That so, yeah. The Harrison Ford has malaria, so he, they can't do the choreograph thing. The other one is an improv line. It's we're going to need a bigger boat. Sure, we're going to need a bigger awesome. boat. Absolutely. No, it's not in the screenplay. It's the best line of the whole fucking movie. <laughs> it's not in the screenplay because Roy Scheider. That's his greatest gift as an actor to all of motion pictures. Is that one line? It's I fantastic. I'm such a Roy Scheider fan. That's fantastic, and I agree. What's the third movie? Yeah. Third is completely scripted, uh, and and this gets to the heart of of Dan Slott. <laughs> this gets to the heart. This is like, what are the things that make you? What are the things that build you up? I will, uh, you know, there was there was a time when I was working on um, before I was working on Amazing. Um, when I was working on an, uh, bef- I think it was the same time I was like working on, uh, just starting to work on initiative or I just got an initiative that uh, Joe Casada. Um, there's so many books that come out every month that there's no way the editor in chief can read all. Of right. It. You know, there's no way. So if you're the editor in chief, you are watching the core franchises. Sure. You know, and anything else that piques your interests you know your favorite artists, your favorite writers. You know you're you're reading you're reading a big stack of comics, but you're not reading like all 180 books every month that your company's putting out because you're also hopefully reading stuff that your competitors sure. are putting out. And that, it's a big stack that you have to read when you're EIC. Um, and the stuff I was doing was She Hulk and Thing and Spidey Torch and Great Lakes, but uh, he started reading Great Lakes. Because, you know, but uh, before that, I think I was really off his radar because I think I was in the stack of books. I wasn't getting okay. read um, because he had so much to do um, But he knew me and, you know, like sure. me, thought I was doing all right. And my editors were happy with the work. So, yeah, all right. But I hadn't broken every time you work for a company. There are many different levels of breaking into the industry. Um, you, you almost get you're breaking in all the time, you know. Um, people forget I had like a whole, this is my second career at Marvel. I was a guy in the nineties right. who had a run and then went away and then right. came back. You're always, absolutely. Yeah. You're always, you're always breaking in and in a weird way, you're breaking into every office and then you're breaking in to your editor in chief. People go, well, I want to write for comics. I want to break in. Breaking in is only half the battle. Staying man. is the second battle. Stay, staying in and, and then breaking into different levels is, is hard. Um, but there was a point where Joe saw me at work in the room, you know, at the mm-hmm. summits. And I was throwing out ideas and people were using them in their books. And uh, I was helping move conversations forward and being a team player. And at one point, Joe came up to me and was like, you have to stop being, you know, you're going to be somebody. You know, you we, we're going to put you on a book. You 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 got it. You have to stop being so precious. You know, um, there's that part of me that's precious. There's that part of me, um, you know, it's a Jewish upbringing that loves schmaltz. <laughs> I love sure. schmaltz. I love the tear jerk. Absolutely, you know? for our for our non uh, non Yiddish uh, inclined uh, listeners. That's what schmaltz is. I, I love schmaltz. You know, it's why, oh, dear God, I can read any Irish player. Sure. <laughs> you know, I just love Russian. You know, I there's this kind of, and some people it's too saccharine. Some people it's too sweet. You know, some people it's that bit of baklava you bite into and it's all honey. <laughs> and you go, ah, oh, too sweet. You I my people in. That's love it. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's like, dude, it's like, you put me in front of an hour of Little House on the Prairie, I'm in tears. <laughs> I'm in fucking tears. I'm in like, Mary Ingalls is blind. 
Ryan. Oh my God. Oh my God. she just wants to see again. <laughs> you know, I just, sure. oh, oh. So, yeah, I will be precious. I will. You read Amazing Spider Man 801 today. Excellent. All right, very good. <laughs> I, I I will go for the, the you know the violins and the, the the bit that makes you go oh yeah that's the I, that's the oh the, there is no better feeling with with Silver Surfer yes when because um, you have a think tank and you run stuff by your think tank and I made sure a lot of the think tank on Silver Surfer were girls no uh, women people. yeah I'm with you and nothing would uh, make me happier than when I would run a Silver Surfer idea by someone. And they would go, oh, <laughs> like, nailed it, <laughs> got it, small city. <laughs> yeah. Outstanding, man. Um, yeah, so the, my third favorite moment in all of uh, – I every time, every time I watch this movie, you get waterworks out of me at this moment. There's no – oh, I just – yeah, city lights. Oh, God, yes, Chaplin. At the very yes. end, the very – I'm not ruining no, no. it. I'm not – that woman who ruined Lawrence Arabia for me, the very end of City Lights. It's a comedy, but you get to that ending, he does, Chaplin does not go for the joke. He goes for pure schmaltz. He goes for for just reaching into your heart and squeezing. I cry every oh, yeah. fucking time at the end of City I Lights. Agree with you. Yes. And, Sometimes I remember it wrong. I think there actually is a title card. You don't need it. it with the last two words yeah, of the movie. Yeah. I Sometimes I remember it wrong. I think there might be a title card. You don't need it. You know what yeah, he's saying. Yeah. You know what she's saying. And, oh, oh my God. That's a beautiful movie. Just, no, it, and especially just, again, having nothing to do with the story, the fact that it was a silent that came after the jazz singer. It was 29 uh, that uh, City Lights was made. I, yeah. Yeah, People, you know, and it's like, uh, oh, you know, actually, there is still value in silent movies, uh, and it was a shame because obviously that didn't last very long. And well, that's what makes the difference between Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin. Charlie Chaplin went for the sentimentality, and Keaton always went for the joke. And they're both geniuses, and 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 oh, absolutely totally. worth for people who wouldn't you necessarily check out a silent movie. You don't know what you're missing. They're geniuses, but yeah, that was the difference. I, there, there's. Um... The, the, one of the things, you know, people are people have different foundations for what make them a storyteller. What are the things that they reach for? What are the things that they care about? Um, and and what their foundations are. And it's always amazing to talk to other creators and find out what's at their bedrock. You know, like uh, John Senior lives for Milton Kniff. Ramita Senior, I'm you know, go on. Yeah. Um, the different people have different things that like, oh, that was their yeah, touchstone. Yeah. And you look to your you look to the masters, you look to the the guys that the, that you worship at their altars and you find out oh, you're really into this uh, guy. Paul McCartney with uh, no. the Everly brothers. Yeah, everyone everyone's got a different thing. Or the thing that really means something to them, which becomes their bedrock. Like with Brian, one of the greatest comic book writers of our era, if not all time. You know, he lives for Mammoth. Yes, of course, absolutely. He, he li- and he lives for uh, Amy, I can't say her full name, uh, who does, uh, no, 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 um, He li- uh, Gilmore Girls, Bunheads, and Ms. now uh, Ms. Yeah. Uh, Sherman. Oh, that's probably, right, you know, yes, the, Amy Three Names, yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would be her mobster name like, if she was a mobster. Amy Three Names is in the house. Come on, let's talk to her. Yeah, but if if you made the Venn diagram of them, in the middle is Brian Michael Bendis. You're right. No, that's a good call. <laughs> like those are two of the people that like he at his yes. heart. You know, like he, he, you know, a lot of us when we have our favorite guys, we want to read those scripts and we want to pull it apart, like pulling apart an engine and see how it works. And we want to, you know, like the when I was a kid, you know, like Chaplin and the Marx Brothers and Hitchcock and Spielberg. Those were like the the temples I worshipped, um, and and I had to see everything, and I had to know everything about how they put together stories, and how they put together jokes, how they put together suspense, how they put together sentimentality, how they 
you know, use the characters sure. to tell stories. Those are the things that that you know I could, I could not read enough were about. You sati- were you cannot- satisfied with the Spielberg? Oh. Sorry, I, but I'm I'm interested that that HBO documentary from a couple months ago. Oh, I like yeah, it. Yeah, that's oh, you know, you I'm know- glad you, because again, it is great. But there's so much more to Spielberg than what we got. Yeah, exactly. The, 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 there, I felt like it scratched uh, the surface. Um, where conversely, like the, the new Fred Rogers documentary. Yes. yes. Must see. 99% on Rotten Tomatoes. It should have been did we, uh, did we, whoever, did, that, whoever did, that Whoever that one fucker was who gave that a bad review. I in that, that era that. where there's which, always. Which, which, no, but Fred Rogers would not have. Well, I agree, but uh, well, yeah, you're right. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but no, we are in that era where now there's. What are you talking about? There's a there's a uh, calculated movement to assure that there won't be a hundred percent again because there's always like a group of assholes that'll knock it down. Now I was going to say also, uh, did you see the Shandling uh, documentary? No, I want to. That's the that's that's the Apico yes. one. Yes. It's, yeah. It's um, incredible. I, no, but oh, but before we leave that, there was like yeah. Go, okay. Go. I saw Lady. I saw Lady Bird. Lady Bird. Lady Bird for the longest time had a hundred percent on Rotten Tomatoes. No one was giving Lady Bird a bad review. I saw Lady Bird and I enjoyed it. I did not have the experience everyone else had. I enjoyed it. I thought it was very well put together. I thought everyone in it was yeah. wonderful. But if you had to ask me, is that a hundred percent movie? Uh, Rotten is that like is that a hundred percent the best movie you've ever seen? I'd say no. I, I would give it an A minus, a B okay. plus. <laughs> you know, in my world, in the world of, you know, maybe I, it's not touch, it's not reaching me the way it reached other people. I go, it's a great movie. It was wonderfully directed. Every actor was great. Is it the hundred percent movie? Not to me. But if I had to review it as a reviewer, I would give it a sure. thumbs up. One guy, for the longest time. It was 100%. And then one day it went to 99. And the guy who did the one negative review pretty much said what I said. And then he said, so I didn't think it deserved to be 100%. So I'm giving it an F rating to drop the score down. So, yeah, so he's looking out for you, dear reader, by <laughs> making this 99%. And exactly. It was a good movie. And you thought it was a good movie. And you're, you're juking the system. You're, you're you're doing this to to so the whole world has to conform to your concept that it's a ninety nine percent movie and not a hundred. What a Matt. dick! Yeah, and and you ever go to like a movie set? You ever go to someone writing a screenplay? You ever go to an actor getting into a tough role? And let me tell you, those roles in Lady Bird, th- that those actors were great. You know, was it the best movie for me? No, I will say that again. But it was a good movie. It's great. <laughs> Um, there's work, there's effort, there's time, there's passion. And to, to be the guy who's a critic off to the side and just doing that manipulatively, manipul- the, 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 if, if that person had honestly felt it was an F, if that person had honestly felt it was a D yeah. or whatever, I would have no problem with them doing that and knocking it down to 99. But the it's the premeditation of I'm going to fuck with you and all that hard work that all those people put into that um that that rankles me um so uh, <laughs> we can wrap if you want dan we've been going good but if you got more, oh, no, that's no, cool too. A, no yeah this is just a weird day for is, me buddy. because it's like, you know it's 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 tony stark start uh, iron man yes. starting but it's it's really about 10 and a half years of spider-man <laughs> rapping and I'm are you cool. going to Midtown? Where are, you, where are you signing today? <laughs> I am signing today at uh, Forbidden Planet near Union sure. Square uh, from six to eight. I want to say it's from six to eight because we did the Midtown uh, Financial District for eight hundred, okay. and we went. I started quarter hour early, and we went through over three hours yeah. late because we, you know, you're showing up with books. I'm signing well, your sure. books, but. We'd have to get to the point where, okay, we're only doing three. Okay, we're only doing one because we got to try to get to everybody. And that's so much better than it was for 700 because for 700, people didn't know this. We had the, you know, back then they didn't know it. We had the death threats. Yeah, that's kind of what I hinted at. I didn't know how much you wanted to talk about that, but there you go. We had, we had, 
honest to God death threats. You had security. This wasn't. Yeah, this wasn't just somebody going. I don't like you. Fuck you, or go die in a fire. It wasn't that. No, it was it was death threats. Um, I showed up to Marvel one day, and there was the head of Marvel security. There was one of our high ranking Marvel guys, and there was someone from the NYPD, and there was their assistant, and someone from the NYPD cyber crimes unit, and their assistant, and someone from the DA's office, and their assistant, and each guy had a big ass file of real legitimate death threats. And yeah. And at two signings, one signing Marvel provided undercover and another signing the NYPD provided undercover. Um, but at this one, it, people don't remember it was, um, it was, we held it out for the week of Christmas and there was a, it was, so it came out, I think it was either the day after Christmas or on Christmas. I think it was yeah, the day the after. Day after. Yeah. Go on. And there was a snowstorm in New York City. Um, and part of the uh, the security guy, uh, one of his uh, protocols was that for the signing, they were only allowing five people up into the store for the signing at a time. Because that way the other guy could keep an eye on all five people. That, that was part of the protocol. And no one knew that's why it was why sure. they were doing it. But they were just letting up five people at a time and five people to leave and five more people go up. And But to do that, and people wanted their 700 signed. So people got there early. And it was a snowstorm. Wow. There were people lined around the blocks for 700, literally around the block. It was this epic line. And no one would leave. And they were out in the fucking snow. And I was working at home, and I had the heater raging, and I was in bundles and layers. And then someone sent me pictures of the line. And I'm looking at these human beings bundled up and freezing and not leaving. And I'm like, I got to get down there. So I got down there hours early because I wanted to get those people out of the snow. And I get there, and, and and we ran late. Like, you know, we it, we took forever to get through everybody. We went hours over, too, and I was hours there early. And um, that was a day. And every single hand that I shook was ice cold. Sure. Every single nose, every single nose was bright red. <laughs> and every person I was talking to for 700 was like this. <laughs> It was insane. Yeah, man. you know the last the last people in through the door were like uh, that. We reached were uh, an entire family from Mexico. Wow. Um, and they were they were. I'm like, oh my god, you guys know I'm doing a convention in Mexico in like <laughs> in a month. And they're like, and they're like, we know, we know, we're going to be there too. Like oh my god, hilarious! Oh my yeah, god, oh I feel, oh yeah, oh Jesus, much, man. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, um, yeah. No, now I'm thinking now 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 I, I put a damper on it because now I'm thinking about the world. So <laughs> uh, we'll keep geez. it light. It's okay, Dad. I'm trying to think of what. Oh else. God. Um, so yeah, Cloak and Dagger. <laughs> your thoughts? Have you watched? I, I here's my thing. Um, I have barely read any comics. Uh, since uh, starting eight, uh, really in earnest, starting Spider Man eight hundred, sure. um, I've rarely watched uh, TV. Okay. Um, uh, just like uh, a couple days ago, when it was some of the worst of the news, yeah. Yeah. Uh, my cable box kind of oh, blew that's, up. That's like very my good. My cable box couldn't right, take exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> <I know. laughs> my I know. cable box was like my cable box was goodbye, crew world. We, yeah, really. You know, it was <laughs> like. Yeah, my cable box is like, dude, I'm doing you a favor. I am blowing up now for your <laughs> exactly. mental state. Yeah, and I was like, so the TV's okay. been dead. And I, you know, I because, you know, Tony Stark's got to come out. Iron Man 100 had to come out. Everything's got to come out. So it had been kind of a crunch. So I have been running out and, like, seeing the odd movie here and there. But uh, I so much of my, like, the content of, of TV shows and comics and stuff I, have been off my radar. Uh, I, I, I am normally a news junkie, so this yeah, I is am too, but it's too much. It's just, and also the, the attention 
to every individual tweet. Dan, I hate TV news right now because it's become sports. I mean, and especially coming I, from a sports broadcasting background of 16 years, I can assure you that is what we get now. And as opposed to reasonable discourse, this is Mets and Yankee fans just yelling at each other and not listening to each other. I, I had I had to I had to go away from Twitter. Yeah. Uh, people, a lot of people think I've blocked everyone, <laughs> and no, I don't. Have, I, no, I don't have a Twitter account. I wow. took it off because. No, because Twitter. I will look at Twitter every now and then. I'll stick my head in and I'll go. I'm gonna. I'm gonna read it. Uh, but I do not do that. I. I have my Instagram. I have my Facebook. Um, recently, uh, a number of people tried to use my Instagram as if it were Twitter, because they they really wanted to reach out from the cyber world and tell me something. Yeah, they really want to do it. Like, it's their entitlement. It's their, you know, you're online somewhere. You must hear my opinion. Yeah. You know, I, I yeah, it, it is not enough for me to talk about you. I have to know that your digital oh, footprint, yeah. you know, yeah. somehow hears my voice, you know, and they, they put this thing on my Instagram account and then someone else responded to that. So their reaction was on it, was linked to this now a thread. And the original post said things that were very heartfelt and passionate. Um, but there was an anger to it. And with that anger came the freedom for that person to say things to me that they wouldn't say to my face because they were that passionate about something. And it's the kind of thing where if I was in public and someone was talking to me, even about an issue they were that passionate about that had merit, and they started reaching that level of discourse, I would walk away. Right. You know, exactly. I'd be like, I'm not, I'm, I'm not listening right. to this. You know, if you want to talk to me about this thing that you're passionate about, I get that. You know, that's totally cool. But the minute you take the level of discourse to this place – you no longer have my ear. And I saw that and went, you know what? You know, I talked to a friend or two, like, do I owe this person a response? Because they are passionate about this and this is an important issue. And they looked at it and they said, not if they're going to talk to you like that, they don't. And I went, okay, I've talked, I've, I've soundboarded this off people. And I went, you know what? I'm deleting that. But that That's not going to be it. My Instagram is for fun, exactly. silly pictures. And it's not for this. That would be Twitter if I was still on Twitter. I'm not. You don't get to have that level of interaction. You have to be able to control your own social media. And obviously you can. And that's – I went through the same thing with Roseanne. I put up that, yeah, good, uh, good riddance. And someone came back with a, well, what about Kathy Griffin argument? And I said, what about Kathy Griffin? And they're like, well, uh, for her to be taken down, it took a lot longer. I'm like, no, it didn't. And by the way, that's my last comment about this. I am done talking about this. If you want to talk about it on your page, that is, it was on my Facebook page. I'm like, that's your prerogative. This is my Facebook page. And I'm not talking about it. And the guy wouldn't give up, so I had to delete him. And it was a guy I knew professionally, and we were acquaintance kind of friends. And he wrote me the nastiest email. How dare you? You're a closed-minded liberal. And all this nonsense. Yeah, how and I said, I, how, dare, how dare you to allow my comments to be on your right, personal, right. you know, social right. and media I, page. Yeah, and then, like I said, the same thing. Hey, man, I keep it light on my Facebook page. I felt I go uh, uh, racism is universal. And thankfully, enough conservatives did step up and say, yeah, that's bad. That's really bad. And I don't and didn't have to resort to what about this uh, liberal that did something similar? And I'm like. Again, I'm like Kathy Griffin got what she deserved uh, with with her thing that people that people were offended by that. It's a free market right now, and you, you got to watch what you say uh, because there's a lot I, of people on the other side that will take you down professionally if you're not careful. When I deleted that comment, it took out the threat, sure. which took out you know like the, the the picture was still there and people's comments were still there. But that person's comment went down, and the response to that comment disappeared as well. 
And that response was also very heartfelt and passionate about the same issue. And that person, um, you know, wasn't rude. That person got their feelings across and was very open and talking about this experience that was very passionate. The first to person them. that made these comments. No, no, okay. the second, the person responded. So they were they. There was the comment that was very passionate and rude, and then someone replied to it. And by me knocking out the first comment, the second sure. comment disappeared as well. It was the tail on the kite. And by taking out the first, there, that person then went to social media going, I tried to talk to Dan Slott about this passionate oh. thing, and he deleted it. What a coward. Dan Slott, you've lost a reader. Dan Slott, yeah. And that's on my Instagram. Oh, you know, so it's like there's no – you have to live with it. Yeah. You have to live with it and just go, I'm fine. Like there was someone – who I got into an internet squabble with because it's me. People are hearing this on the, on the podcast going an internet squabble what, with yeah. Dan Slott. <laughs> well, that's unheard of. <laughs> but someone got into an internet squabble with me about something and they were saying something that was clearly a lie. And I could prove to him it was a lie. Here is the receipt. You're saying this happened in a Spider-Man story. You're saying it happened in this issue. You're saying it happened on this page. Here is the entire page. That never happened. You imagined it. And you have been going after me for an imagined slight. You know, and they're like, well, you're losing a reader. Right. And I said to them, well, if, you know, I have no problem if a person like you who's willing to spread a lie, if I lose you as a reader, I can sleep better at night. You know, I'll sleep okay knowing I've lost you. Goodbye. That person then took that quote that I said, and they cut out who tells a lie. Right. To imply that, and I'm not going to say what it was, whether their race, creed, color, religion, orientation, was what I was saying when I said people like you. I'm with you. So they're going, Dan Slott hates name of this place. He said he sleeps better at night knowing people like me, yeah. you know, aren't reading his book. And no, no. What I said, people like you who right. lie, <laughs> not, and I meant people like two legged hominin. Of course. You know? Yes. Anyone who lies. <laughs> Almost yeah. Yeah. anyone who lies. I'm yeah. with you. Anyone, any, any living, breathing human being on planet earth, any of the 6 billion of us, not you from your, whatever right. group you belong to, whatever, whatever politics you ascribe to or whatever, you you know your makeup is or how you identify yourself that wasn't I what i was saying that's clearly in the original line what i was saying and then i see them say that and then i'm watching all the people on the thread going wow dan slot hates these yep. people i never knew that about dan slot i'm telling all my friends i'm never reading a dan slot comic again what a horrible human and what am i going to do am i going to jump into that thread and go that's not what i said no, because then you're suddenly you're spending your whole life, yes, you know, fighting these fights, fighting these fights, you know, and and suddenly having to correct everyone and pulling out all the things or having giant folders where you've saved screen caps of everything you've ever said, you know, it's like who has the time to curate that? We're not movie stars, comic book writers and comic book artists. We don't have an entourage. We don't have. You know, we don't live in luxury apartments and can hire someone to curate our social I media. Well, and again, yeah, you're right. Well, and it, that's that's the best and worst thing about comic books is you can approach one of you, a creator, and say, hey, you're great, or I didn't like this. But again, some people abuse the privilege, and especially in the current social media environment, which oh, unfortunately, yeah. I don't know if we can ever come back to a more civil discourse. I, I don't think so. I would have killed. I would have killed to have this growing up. If you told me growing up there was a magic box and I could type whatever I want into it and I can get it onto the doorstep of, you know, Gil Kane or John sure. Romita Sr. or Roy Thomas, if I could send them a message and they talk back to me, oh my God, it would be like, you know, it's like Raiders of Lost Ark. It's a radio transmitter for talking to God. <laughs> you know, it's. Yeah, it would be the most magical device. And instead, people are using it to, 
you know, to tell that stand-up comic, you yes, suck. And you, and you hate. You know, it's something and you hate, and you hate uh, a certain group of people or whatever. No, or I agree. Or just what? It, it's suddenly, and people don't understand the difference of, you know, adding someone, you know, versus talking about them. You know, I. Someone says there's a difference to. I think George Clooney movies suck. To. Yeah. Hey, George Clooney's a personal account that I know you're looking at. You suck. There's a difference to that. You're not entitled to the other one. And by, the minute you start, the minute you start doing that, the minute people start doing that is when the um, the Kelly Murray trans go away. The you know the way they go. Well, I'm not going to be online. You don't you don't get to come right, after me that right. way. Or is it the girl from yes, Stranger yes. Things? Millie Bob Millie Three Brown. Names, exactly. Um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, the, you know, and the stuff that was being done against her. Horrible. You know, Absolutely. they're you know, internet, but they're like internet provocateurs who are like, clearly we didn't mean this. Clearly we're making jokes that are so beyond the pale that they're funny. You don't get to decide that. You don't get to, you, you know, you don't get to decide that for her. Right. You can decide that for yourself. You and your a cabal of your friends can decide that for each other. You can throw it out to the world, freedom of speech, and go, this is what we meant. This is our 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 purposely over-the-top kind of humor. But you don't have the right to tell her how she right. should feel about that and her decision to pull up shop and go, you know what? I'm not right. doing it. Um, Paul Pelletier, a great comic mm-hmm. book artist, never went online. Smart guy. Has no, Smart guy. Yeah, he yeah. has – no imprint. He has no digital I print. Think he, he doesn't have pulled away. Amen. Yeah, he has. From, no, but from day one, he's like, I'm not going to talk to people on message boards. I'm not going to have a, uh, you know, a Twitter handle. I'm not going to do. I don't need that. You know, I want to talk to people. I, you know, I go to the basketball court. <laughs> I want to talk to people. You know, I, I do whatever I want. Sure. I hang out with my wife. I, I want to talk to people. I do this. I, I'm not into that. That's not my thing. And he has had such a happier life. So many people I know, you know, he doesn't go down the rabbit hole. I mean, I, you know, there's there's a difference to how we deal with all this stuff. Like, you know, I come from a family that when we start arguing and yelling at each other, you know, every family oh, yeah. has arguments. But as the argument would die down and coming to a – a natural conclusion for any normal people outside of the slot family and where, where, where the, where the, the argument would be done. One of us, never my father, one of us, who's not my father would, would he was level, always level headed would always go on the way out. The door would kind of whisper the rebuttal <laughs> under the breath. Oh, sure. But loud enough for the person to hear it, or enunciated enough for the person to hear it. So then they're, oh, you feel that? And they would go <laughs> back up. The volume, and then it would be round two. And then it would be round three. And that's the way we're wired. So the internet in that format is the worst place for me. Because someone says, you know, that one extra comment, you want to get the last word. And they're saying something that's full of crap. You want to put them right. Well, now they're going to go, meh. Well, no, you don't get to go, meh to me. I go, meh to you. And then suddenly it's, you know, it's a huge epic thread. So I'm not wired right for this. You know, I'm not wired right for having this kind of interaction um, with, with, with I throw out a tweet and you throw out a tweet because it'll just go yeah, on forever. No, I, we've had this you discussion know? before, either on the air or off the air. But this is something I've said to other creators. You're never going to win an argument with Vader 28. Oh, it's, it's not even that. Like, let's say you're somebody who runs a gossip site. You know, you poke a creator the right way. They argue with you. Then you say something, you know, you get the last word and they argue back. And then you do it right, and they argue answer. back. And then, and then you get that long thread and then that person from that gossip site – can curate and cherry pick Absolutely. a whole bunch of those, and now they have an article. Yeah, too. that too. Yes, indeed. They yeah. have an article. So they half of what they're doing, they know what they're doing. They're doing it because now you've ju- you've given them sure. content, and now they're going to get sure. clicks. 
and they're going to get ad revenue and they're going to get because you just did their work for them. So it's it's frustrating is that it's a different form of language and people have different goals, you know, Um, and there's people who are kind of shameless who, you know, they want the content. You know, for that right. gossip site, or they want that. So they'll they'll do what they can to prolong something. They'll do what they can uh, with the bigger profile person to stray sand affect it. <laughs> they'll they'll do what they can. You know, and it's you have it takes so you know, especially people for me from a different generation. You know, where it takes a while for you to go. This is the language of social media. This is the way this works. I have to know that before going in. Yeah, I do. You know? No, I agree with you. And and then you add bots into the mix, and you add sock puppets. Oh, God, and you yes. add that's my all... favorite thing, is the assumed name. And uh... no, Yeah, you add all these yeah. other things into the mix, and you're not even having a right. fair fight. Well, yeah, because I'm agreeing oh. with myself with six different Twitter and Facebook accounts that it's the same person, but they're just pretending that it's suddenly a group. Yeah, I, no, dude, it's sick. It's Well, even benign things, geek.com was very kind and put me on a list of these are the comic book podcasters you should listen to. And and truly, this was nothing, no malice whatsoever, but he's like, Word Balloon, I really like John Suntress's podcast. Sometimes it isn't a comic book thing, but this Canadian really does a great job. And I laughed because, yeah. And I'm like, hey, man. Exactly. And and so in the comments, I'm like, dude, thanks so much. Really appreciate being part of the list. By the way, not Canadian, from Chicago, born and bred. But again, thank you. Love the Canadians. Why are you, why are you having no, against and Canadians? It, and thankfully, it never went anywhere. But of course, he never changed the article to say, oh, this guy from Chicago. No, nah, it's up there. And it's like, all right, well, that's a little factual thing, and it's nothing. But you might want to get it right. I, now. I, I, nope, it's done. Uh, oh. Oh, and now out comes, you know, the knives. <laughs> it, it, you can't, you know, and yeah, oh, my God. Sense. I'm like, hey, man, uh, God, thank you. This is great. Geek.com, thank you very much. That's that's nice publicity and praise. I can't thank you enough. I'm just not Canadian, that's I'm, all. I'm putting up this funny picture of a cat. Why do you hate dogs? <laughs> <laughs> I hear you, man. Woof. I'm putting up this funny picture of a cat. Did you watch the whole video? Did you know that before and after they stuck peanut butter on it? Did you know that the RSPCA is a... I didn't know that! I put up this funny picture of a cat. It's crazy, man. <laughs> you know, it, there's nothing you can yeah. do that yeah. won't offend somebody. There's nothing you can do that... Or, you know, let's let's say you screw up online. Let's say you screw up online and people don't have the full context. They don't see what was happening before and they don't see what was happening after. And you can do all the right moves. You can put out a retraction. You can say you were sorry. You can do the best apology in the world. You can, a week later, go to a convention, find the person, and apologize to them in person. And you can have a moment with them where you bury the hatchet and everything is fine and you even laugh about it. And all it takes is someone else to find that nugget you know, a year later and it, you know, it never goes away. It never goes away. It never goes away. James Gunn does when he made super does a parody of the 50 superheroes and villains that he'd like to fuck or have sex with. I forget what the actual title was. Um, And um, it became this cause celeb. And this is before guardians came out. How dare this man does not deserve to direct a a Marvel movie. Disney, get rid of this man. Uh, Where are all of you now? Two, two one movie, and also again, completely taken out of context. The guy was just doing raunchy uh, roast kind of comedy that it's a no holds barred. It was, and and uh, it, and he was vilified uh, for two seconds, and then Guardians came out, and everyone loved James Gunn and how he can make a Marvel movie, and and it's like <laughs> fuck all of you that were so offended, John, you know, John, nothing, nothing, nothing is more is more emblematic of what's been going on now in that I called to talk yeah. about Ten and a Half Years of Spider-Man, and now we're talking about social wanna... media. Oh, my God. You know, this is the most Dan Slott podcast <laughs> ever. Well, and before we – go ahead. Because I, no, because I would love – I would love to put all this in a box and and shove it in the back of the closet. 
Um, you know, and that's, you know, that's another good beat. It's like, um, when, when I was working on yes. surfer with, with all right, something that made it so enjoyable, uh, I made a, a conscious effort. It was an experiment. I was like, I will not go on any silver surfer message board. I will not respond to any negative silver surfer comment said on any form of social media. I will just be happy with the happy stuff. Everything else goes in a box and I don't even look at it. Uh, the, I was reading reviews and, and go, Oh, cause for the most part, they're yeah, all good. Yeah. Reviews. <laughs> for, but you know, I'd hit a negative review and I'd be like, let it go. You know? So that was, I tried that, but with Spider-Man, you know, I'd been in the mix for so long and I'd been on the message boards for so long. And I'd been that a part of me said, okay, when you go on to Tony Stark, Iron Man, when you go on to fantastic four, remember how happy you were on silver surfer. You remember what a great experience that was on silver surfer. So don't start up, you know, when Spider-Man is done, you can put that all in the box. You can still talk, say goodbye to people on social message boards and, uh, social media and message boards. You can wrap up conversations. You can do things. But when you go on to the next two, don't even look. Don't even look. Have the work and be happy, you know, and the time you were going to spend, you know, because that's the other thing. Like, I remember when I was um, working at Marvel at the beginning, my first time at Marvel in the 90s, um, I was on staff. And back then on staff, uh, it wasn't frowned upon for people who were on staff to also write like everyone on staff. Like if you were an editor, you were also writing a comic book. Yeah. You know, Mark Rupal, yeah. Tom DeFalco, Bob Harris, they were all writing as well yeah. as editing. And it was very, uh, the nepotism was thick. Yeah. Yeah. We all remember. Uh, yeah. Roll the readers. Yeah. Yeah. But I was, it was great for me because that's why I got, that's why I became a, uh, a college intern is why I accepted a staff job. I wanted to network. You know, someone actually gave me that advice. I want to say it was Jim Valentino when I was at a con. I was like, how do I break into comics? And he gave me that blueprint. You know, you want to network. You want to get the Marvel. You want to know people. And then you can get work. And as soon as I got my first monthly title, I left staff. So that, But that was the way it was then. I remember back then, it's so not that way now. <laughs> do not try to break into the industry that way now it does not work that way those days are decades ago and they're done they're over but back then um i remember having like my first laptop um and i was uh filling in for the receptionist uh as part of my job that the receptionist had to take a bathroom break i left my staff job and i would sit out the reception for you know 20 minutes and it would happen every now and then, but I'd be bored because back then people didn't come up to the offices all the time. So you'd just be sitting there. So I'd bring out my laptop and I'd try to get some of my Marvel work done. And I remember Tom DeFalco walking by and he saw that on my laptop was a game, uh -huh. you know, and he knew, he knew I was writing stuff uh, also. And he saw there, there was like some tank game on my, my laptop. And he, he went, don't have that on your laptop. And that don't work while you're at the reception desk. Don't have that on your laptop. You know, I'm like, why? He's like, if you have that on your laptop, whenever you're stuck on a story, you will always play that game. Oh, that's a good call. Yeah. Yeah. Your, your lap, you know, your, your, your make this for your work. Don't have other Very things smart. on it. Yeah. Well, now if you're, you know, so many freelancers, you know, especially writers, you're working on this magic box. And if you're stuck, it's also a window into the oh, internet. Yeah, distractions, massive you know, distractions. There's there's no way to undo it. it. It's this is the way this thing works now. So if you're stuck, and we get stuck all the time, and if you're a freelancer and if you're a writer, you're in a box. And a lot of times the sun goes like if you're a photographer in a dark room, the sun goes up, the sun goes down. You don't know. You know, you work until the sure. story is done, but you it can't be helped. You'll get stuck. And then you'll go online. I'll just poke my head in for a little bit. And then you go online. You're like, ah. So like, 
and then and then it's a, a time suck. Um, there are things that like uh, I use it. Colleen Duran uses it. Other people use it. There's a program called uh, Self Control yes. where you lock yourself out of the internet. I use this all the time now. So it's like I used to use it sparingly. Now I use it That's all weird. the time. I just, the internet disappears. You know, you don't get through a quadruple sized Amazing Spider Man 800 and have unfettered access to the internet. Understand? You just don't. It doesn't happen. No, it's happen. a massive time suck. So, That's why I stopped playing uh, video games. I used to play uh, Wing Commander on my computer, on my desktop computer. And I would look up and go, every, What do you mean every, I've been playing this for three hours? Dude. People who listen to this who aren't from our age group have no fucking idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Isn't that great? Wing Commander. I, you know, th- that is so old that you know it's old because when it was old and already gone, they made a movie of it with yes, Freddie Prince it. Jr. Horrible. And that movie, that movie is old and, and gone horrible. and no one Absolutely remembers it. Absolutely it is, yes. Yeah, yeah. but I uh, see, I was that way uh, worse because this is an age before – you could even play video games online. I had in my apartment, this same apartment. My God, I've been here for a quarter century. I had this insane setup with um, a, a Sega Genesis tower. It was a Sega Genesis on top of the original Sega CD with a 32X on top of this Genesis and with a cartridge into the 32X that allowed you to also play European and Japanese games. It looked like a giant totem pole. It was like this. And it was all off of that 16-bit Genesis. Okay, so I had that. I had uh, I had the Genesis. I had the N64. I had the PlayStation 1, the PlayStation 2. I had um, Sega Saturn with uh, – every single, every single thing had a, a mod chip so I could play all the foreign games. Um, I had uh, TurboGrafx-16. Um, I'm trying to think what else. I said Dream, uh, Dreamcast. I had, I had these insane setups with every controller under the sun. You know, fishing rod controllers. <laughs> you were like the forty, like the forty year old virgin when he's got his room of uh, video games and everything. One, yes. Two, <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> Three, fuck you again. I didn't say that you were <laughs> yeah. the forty year old virgin, Dan. I said it was <laughs> like that from a gaming <laughs> standpoint. Nice, 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 nice save, Sentris. <laughs> I'm 50. I'm Suck it. buddy. I'm no. right ahead of you. You know that. <laughs> I love you. The, no, what, the saddest was I had the, you know, you had the games with the dance mats. I had the game that had the dance mat that you plugged into the dance mat, Virtual Maracas. So you could play this one game, Samba de Amigo, where you had to make a monkey in a sombrero shake its maracas at the right time to stuff like living la vida loca so i you know i had giant mech controllers i had everything under the sun um and i so i had this insane setup and i would have game nights and i would bring all these guys over for video game nights and a lot of guys from the comedy oh one sec one sec hello hey are you in so we're going to talk about stuff. Okay, this this is the this is the perfect place to stop. I'm going to talk to my editor because this is comics and this we're is what we up. do. All right, Danny. So we're wrapping up. So this well, is Danny, great. It was my pleasure to so, be your exit interview, and uh, we look forward to what's coming up. So keep it up. Yeah, this is all fantastic. So yay! All right, we'll, we'll, we'll pick up this story in our next conversation <laughs> and talk about. This is the most possible Spider-Man thing we ever could have talked about because we never talked about Spider-Man. I'll talk to you later. John, Thanks, talk to you later. Bye. Bye. There you go. Was it a question about Iron Man? Was it something about Fantastic Four? God only knows. He kept it quiet. But uh, that's literally how it ended. And here we are now, me putting this podcast episode out for you this morning uh, because uh, we're seeing this end of uh, Dan Spider-Man run, the beginning of his Iron Man run. And uh, more great stuff coming in August with the Fantastic Four. So uh, it's a fun time to be a Dan Slot fan. And uh, I hope you enjoyed today's epic conversation on Word Balloon. Again, brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. This is what we do here at Word Balloon. And we do it 
uh, because of the help of the League of Word Balloon listeners who support me through their subscriptions via Patreon. If you like what you hear on Word Balloon and you want to support the cause, go to patreon.com slash Word Balloon or wordballoon.com and click on the Patreon ad. But thank you very much, Word Balloon listeners. Word Balloon is also brought to you by InStock Trades at InStockTrades.com. Great collections of dance lot work, uh, including uh, the Spider Man Big Time collection. Not only Dan Slott, but Fred Van Lenti and Christos Gage, uh, Umberto Ramos, Stefano Caselli, Marcos Martin, Ty Templeton, Javier Polito, Riley Brown, among the great artists on this uh, collection. 42% off, $23.19 for the Big Time Ultimate Collection. You can also get Spider-Man Flying Blind. That's Mark Wade and Dan Slott. Giuseppe Camucoli and other artists involved, 42% off, it's $9.85. There's also Spider-Man Spider Island, the trade paperback. Dan Slott and others contributing, but you know Dan ran that uh, wonderful event. It's 42% off, $20.29. There's the Lizard trade paperback, No Turning Back. That's Dan Slott and Kurt Busick. Uh, This collection, man, Ron Friends and uh, Giuseppe uh, 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 Kamun Coley also doing the art on that. 42% off, $9.85. Just tons of great dance lot uh, collections here at InStockTrades.com. You can get into The Superior Spider-Man, My Own Worst Enemy, Volume 1. That one is 42% off. It's Dan Slott and Ryan Stegman. Uh, It's uh, $10.43. Volume 2, Troubled Mine, also $10.43. There's Volume 3, No Escape. And uh, that one is uh, $10.43 as well. So the first three volumes of Superior Spider-Man. Reach back for She-Hulk by Dan Slott. We talk a little She-Hulk, obviously. Uh, That is uh, 42% off, $20.29. How about Batman Arkham Asylum, Living Hell? One of the last things that Dan did for DC. Dan, a great Batman writer. Him and Ryan Sook, among others, 42% off, $13.33. And then, of course, there's uh, the great run on Silver Surfer. You can get Volume 1, New Dawn. That is uh, $10.43, 42% off at InStockTrades.com. So don't take my word for it. Go there. If you you love slot, lots of product there. Other artists, other writers, all available to you uh, at great prices. InStockTrades.com. Thanks again for listening to Word Balloon. I'm a little punchy because... I've been up uh, since, uh, you know, four this morning when I got Dan's message. Hey, I want to talk. So uh, enjoy this. Back uh, with more great content. June is an explosive month. It was already prior to this Dan Slot conversation, but I wanted to get it up front because it's breaking news as uh, Dan completes his run on Spider-Man with today's 801. Enjoy your comics week. We got more great stuff coming up in the days ahead. June is not over, and neither is Word Balloon. Lots of great conversations still to come for the month of June into July. Uh, it's going to be a great summer, and I'm happy to spend that time with you right here on Word Balloon. Until next time, Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions, copyright 2018. <laughs>